Hey. Okay. Welcome, Hearth and Homies. Tonight's show is suspense. This show was broadcast on CBS from 1940 all the way to 1962. It is seen as one of the premier shows of the golden age of radio. Now, of course, as the name says, suspense, the show tended to focus on suspenseful thriller type scripts. Now, the show went through many phases over the years and went through a lot of different actors, a lot of different hosts and writers. One thing that stayed consistent was that the show would always dive into something bizarre and different. The first episode that we'll hear tonight is called The Lodger. It was actually the audition show for CBS and it's directed by Alfred Hitchcock. So tonight we've taken this classic show, Suspense, and put it with videos of beautiful scenery, maybe even spooky scenery, to give you a unique old time radio viewing experience. So sit back and enjoy the show. And as always, thanks for tuning in. This is Hollywood and CBS presenting forecast number four. Herbert Marshall, directed by Alfred Hitchcock in the first program of a proposed new series entitled Suspense. Tonight's forecast program, ladies and gentlemen, represents the ideal form of collaboration. Mr. Alfred Hitchcock, brilliant English director of such outstanding motion pictures as The 39 Steps, Rebecca, and Foreign Correspondent, was eager to create a very special type of radio drama, The Suspense Story. As narrator and star for his production, he thought at once of the distinguished actor with whom he had been associated in countless British film successes, Herbert Marshall. Mr. Marshall suggested that they dramatize a certain favorite story of his. And that story happened to be the very one Mr. Hitchcock had had in mind. Mrs. Bella Clown's classic in Chills, The Lodger. Lodger is a work of fiction which springs from recorded fact. A story which begins in the year 1888 in London. A London terrorized by the fifth in a succession of recent murders. It was believed that these deeds were the work of one person, a tall, gaunt figure in a black Inverness cape, carrying a small, narrow bag. That meager description, provided by a highly unnerved witness, was the sum total of all that was known of the murderer. It was enough, however, to keep alive and alert the interest of all London, of all those in fine quarters, and all those in small, grimy houses, as, for example, Ellen Bunting. Ellen was no different from all the other middle-aged housewives dwelling in the great city's squalid Whitechapel district. She knew all the known facts of the case. As Herbert Marshall will tell you, Ellen knew it was quite proper to refer to this wielder of the knife as the Avenger. Of course, Ellen Bunting was far more concerned with her personal problems than with thoughts of the Avenger. Yet the case of that strange, elusive killer quite often forced all other matters from her mind. There was that mad, meaningless scheme he seemed to follow. All his victims, for example, had been women. All had been young, attractive, and oddly enough, blonde. But Ellen could no more understand the motive for his brutal slashings than could the police. This night, she and her husband, Robert Bunting, sat before their fireplace reading the newspaper account of the latest murder. The Avenger had struck again. As Ellen expressed it, he might be anybody. He might be the fellow you pass on the street. It's a terrible thought. Yes. If only the police had something to go on. It looks like that Avenger's just too quick for him. Look, it says here that this girl he got last night was like all the others. Hmm. Pretty, blonde, and, uh, let's see, described by her friends as a very light-hearted girl. 
What a pity. Did you ever stop to think who fits that to a T? In fact, fits all those girls? Why? Why, my own Daisy. Oh, that's a horrible thought. Well, maybe it's a good thing she's with her aunt, then, instead of here. Mm. London ain't a safe place for any girl right now. Ah, just the same. I can't help thinking how fine it'll be to have her back in. Now, Bunting, you know that Daisy seems just as much my own daughter as she is yours. Mm. But I'm telling you, there's no sense even thinking about having her back right now. We just can't afford it. Oh, I know that, and then... Honey, well, well, maybe we could manage it some way. How? And... Haven't I scrimped myself half crazy trying to keep us going? But you don't care about that, do you? No, your daisy's more important to you than I am. No, 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 really, really, that don't sound like you. Oh, I you. can't help if it don't. What are we going to do? Tell me that. We'll get along, dear. Something will turn up. Oh, and... we haven't had a lodger for months. Nobody even comes to look at the room anymore. Yes, but things will work out a little bit. Oh, they ain't never going to work out. Soon we won't even have a roof over our heads and... Oh? Oh, I'm sorry, Robbie, I... I didn't mean to take on so. Oh, I know, dear, I know. It's all right. Oh, I, I didn't think it. It's just that I, I've been so worried. Well, don't you go worrying another second, old girl. Why, first thing you know, you won't be pretty anymore. You'll have your face all wrinkled. Now, and see now, here, come on, now, let's see a smile. Come on, just have one oh, smile. Oh, leave me alone. Just one I smile like you used to, eh? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, who do you suppose that could be? A oh, late for visitors, I... Bunting... Do you think it could be somebody looking for rooms? Well, it might be. Want me to go to the door? No, I'll go. Oh. You just stay here. Yes, all right. Now, be sure you get a good look at the reason before you let them in, dear. Oh, I'm coming. Oh, I do hope it's... <clears throat> yes, sir? Is it not true that you let lodgings? Yes, sir. Uh, won't you come in, sir? Thank you. Uh, could I, uh, could I take your cape, sir? There's no need. No, I, um, uh, I'm looking for a quiet room. It must be quiet. Oh, we have that, sir. Above all, our, our house is quiet. Uh, your bag, sir, may I take it? No, I'll hold it. it would be so good as to show me the room, please. Oh, oh yes, yes, sir. It's right up these stairs, sir. Uh, this way. Thank you. Uh, you see, sir, uh, there's just my husband and me here, and we're ever so quiet, and... And I'm sure you'll find this room to your liking, sir. Here we are. Now I'll, I'll just light the gas. There. Mm -hmm. Very good. It is pleasant, isn't it, sir? And, and there's not many rooms with such pretty pictures. Are there now? We've had them in the family for years, sir. And... Pictures interest me very little. You see, what really impresses me about the room is the very simplicity of it. The... Um... The bareness. Uh, yes, sir. It's not at all crowded, is it? It will be quite suitable, Mrs. Um, uh, Bunting. Mrs. Bunting. You see, I could do a great deal of studying in my book here. The Holy Bible. Uh, yes, sir. Um, please, sir, uh, let me help with your luggage. No, don't touch it. Oh, but I, I only wish to... Oh, you only wish to help, of course. You must forgive me, Mrs. Uh, Bunting. It's just that I... I'm so very weary. Of course, sir. He bringeth them to their desired haven. Beautiful words, Mrs. Bunting. Indeed they are, sir. And now at last I have found my haven of rest. Yes, sir. Then then you'll be taking the room. Let us see now. Uh, what are you going to charge me? With attendance, mind. I shall be staying in most of the time and I shall be wanting meals. Oh, we can see to that, sir. Then does um, 30 shillings a week suit you? 30, uh, why, why, yes, sir. Yes, sir, that will be quite all right. Good, and I shall pay you in advance. My name is Sleuth. Mrs. Bunting. Mr. Sleuth. S-L-E-U-T-H. Think of a hound, Mrs. Bunting, and you'll never forget my name. Twenty-three, four, thirty, thirty shillings. Thank you, sir. And I think I should enjoy a little light supper now, Mrs. Bunting. Bread and butter, perhaps. Could you arrange that? Well, certainly, sir. I I'll do that now. And uh, if you'd be requiring any beer or spirits... Certainly or... not. Oh, sir... What, what did I say? I thought you understood me, Mrs. Bunting, and I had hoped that you and your husband were abstainers. But we are, sir. We don't keep nothing about. I would have had to go out and... Of course, of course. Oh, I'm sorry, Mrs. Bunting. I fear I spoke sharply. I don't wish you to think you're rude. After all, you, you've you been so kind. Consider it. I hope I know a gentleman when I see one. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, I'll just hurry with your supper. Take 
Take your room. Don't bother me now. I have to get him to see somebody. What do you mean? Come to the kitchen where he won't hear us. He took it, Ellie. He took the room? Yes. We're all right now. Look. Thirty shillings. A week in advance. Oh, it's wonderful. Wonderful. And Ellie, do you see what this means? Yes, you can have Daisy now. Yes. Uh, Here, Bunting. Warn that teapot and put some tea leaves. Right, oh, right. Yeah, do you know something, old girl? We're not going to worry too much about Daisy being in danger of that Avenger fella. Whatever do you mean, Robbie? Well, she's not a girl who takes a drink, you know. Oh, um, what's that to do with it, please? Oh, something I read in the paper while he was upstairs with the gentleman. They just found out that every one of the Avenger's victims had been drinking. They figured he must be some kind of a rabid abstainer. What a peculiar chap. Now hurry, Bunting, please. Yes. Two thoughts. Two thoughts only governed Ellen's mind. The lodger's light supper and her own good fortune at having such a lodger. Mr. Sleuth was an eccentric sort, but then he was such a gentleman, so quiet, so very religiously inclined. She started up a staircase to Mr. Sleuth's room, her husband at her side. Won't do no harm to be safe, though, once Grace is back in London, eh? We'll see she stays closer than the ass, hmm? Well, I'll be downstairs. Hurry up with his supper, old girl. She has cast down many wounded from her. Yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Come in. And to know the wickedness of folly. Why, Mr. S- yes? What is it? Those pictures. Those pretty girls. You've turned all their faces to the wall. <laughs> And that maneuver, that strange action, was the beginning of Ellen's concern. Soon there came to her a recollection of the black Inverness cape, the small narrow bag, the urgent matter of alcoholic drink. And these details began to shape themselves into a pattern which grew more disturbing with each passing hour. The day following, the lodger did not leave the upstairs room once, nor did he leave the next day. And the oddness of this took its place in the pattern. Then, too, the approaching arrival of Daisy, her stepdaughter, added to her concern. On the second night, her sleep was restless with vague, horrifying images. And so, when she heard the first stealthy footsteps outside her bedroom, she was instantly awake. Densely, she followed those steps downstairs, down the hallway. She heard the front door open and then click shut. Utter stillness fell upon the house. And outside the streets were so silent she could hear distinctly the clock from a church tower a mile away told the hour. In her troubled frenzy, she pictured a lone figure plodding through the deep fog, moving quietly, stealthily, stalking, searching, finding... Soon after she heard the lodger return, she sought to quiet the horrible dread which had possessed her. She assured herself that Daisy's arrival that day was no cause for alarm. Now she reasoned, how could there be anything really evil about so religious a gentleman as Mr. Sleuth? But for her there was no more sleep, merely a tormented state of half-consciousness, a state which suddenly dropped from her shortly after the daybreak. Horrible murder. That was the piercing scream of a newsboy far down the street. The Avenger! Right during night! Ellen Bunting heard the boy cry out the Avenger's latest stroke, made during the night. Ellen's first glimpse that morning of the grey-faced lodger brought the steepest night's warm terror full to the surface. But on the next instant, she saw the pitiable, helpless weariness in his eyes, and curiously the terror began to pass. She found that she was hoping desperately that her fears were unfounded. 
Earlier, she had determined to tell Bunting of the awful convictions in her mind. Now, however, she felt she must be certain. Certain before she spoke to a soul. She knew there was one thing she must examine. That was the lodger's single piece of luggage. She'd thought of it often. What could it hold? Not much in the way of clothing, surely. It was too small, too, too narrow. It was more like a case. A case for a knife. It was along toward noon that Evan found her opportunity to search the lodger's room. Soon after Bunting left to meet Daisy, Mr. Sleuth himself walked from the house. Ellen watched the tall, thin figure in the black Inverness cape disappear down the street, and then she rushed upstairs into the room. Quickly, she moved to the closet. It was no different from what it had always been, utterly empty. She found nothing under the bed. She went then to the chest of drawers against the wall. She opened the top drawer and found inside nothing but a frayed shirt, two handkerchiefs. The next drawer, under clothes, socks. The next empty. There remained then only one possible place for the small, narrow bag. The bottom drawer, and it was locked. Hugging at the drawer, she heard suddenly the opening of the front door downstairs. Panic stricken, she rushed out of the room and down the hall to the head of the stairs. Upstairs, Ellen. Ellen, Daisy's here. Oh, Mother Ellen, it's so good to see you. And oh, whatever's the matter? Yes, you've gone quite white. Oh, well, I, I'm all right. I, I wasn't expecting you so soon. Oh, you don't know how fine it is to be back, Mother Ellen. Oh, the country's all right in its way, but. There's nothing like London now, is there? No, no, there isn't. But as long as that adventure's about, I can see we're going to have to do something about these blonde locks, eh, Ellen? Oh, don't worry about that. I'll dye them, maybe. Or or just pin them under my hat. (laughs) (laughs) Daisy, I I might as well get you settled. Oh, now, Father, isn't that just like her? She's straight to the point. No point. Well, I'll bet a sixpence you'll have a dust cloth in your hand before you've got your coat (laughs) off. Mrs. Bunting, I see my door is open. Oh, we we were just leaving, so we... Does this mean that all of you have been in my room? Oh, not at all, sir. I... What must I do? Keep it locked? But you see, sir, I was just tidying up a bit, and, and Mr. Bunting, he brought his daughter up, sir. She she just arrived. This is Daisy, sir. Pleased to meet you, sir. Uh, she, she, she's she been away for quite a long while, you see, Mr. Sleuth, and that, 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 that's why we're a bit excited, you might say. Yes, you must have been surprised when you came in. Hearing us laughing and carrying on that way. Yes, yes, I must say I was. However, Miss uh, Daisy, there are all types of joy, are there not? Yes, I'm sure there are. The despicable evil joy of the abandoned and the divine happiness of the blessed. A vast difference, that. You do understand me, don't you? Why, yes, sir. Yes, Mr. Sleuth. I devoutly hope so, Miss Daisy. Nowadays, there are so very few young women like yourself who do. In fact, I, I all but despaired ever of finding one. If, if you'll excuse us now, sir, we'll, we'll be getting Daisy's things put away. Of course, Mrs. Bunting, and I must be getting to my room. Believe me, Miss Daisy, it's been a revelation to meet you. Oh, thank you, sir. I'm sure we should have much to discuss. He's <laughs> a queer one, all right. But such a gentleman, isn't he? <laughs> At that moment, Ellen had been determined to pour out her terrible knowledge, and then the moment passed by. She told herself that perhaps the past few days had been nothing more than a grim illusion, a tormenting play of imagination. She would wait then until she had attended the coroner's inquest into the last Avenger murder. There, perhaps, she could hear evidence to disprove all her fears, to assure her there was no earthly harm in Daisy being so near the lodger. This was her gravest concern now, for on the next day, Mr. Sleuth made it a point to see the girl more than once, and fearfully, Ellen saw that Daisy welcomed his visits. As Ellen was preparing to step out to the inquest, she heard once more the voices of her stepdaughter and the lodger coming to her through the kitchen door. She hesitated before entering. <laughs> Tense. Strangely apprehensive. I've never known a gentleman with such funny ideas. <laughs> oh, Mother Ellen, you should hear what Mr. Sleuth was just saying. Perhaps, Daisy, you'll excuse yourself. And... He thinks people, and especially girls, should spend all their time praying. I sought to explain, Mrs. Bunting, that all women are placed on this earth filled with evil. They therefore must struggle constantly to find the paths of righteousness. Why, Mr. Sleuth, you mean a girl's not to enjoy life at all? Not to have fun? Frivolity, my child, is the devil's breeding ground. And all his implements are there. Temptation, pleasure, 
Why? Oh, that's crazy. <laughs> well, there's nothing I like better than a glass of wine. And I'm not... You drink. She didn't know what she was saying, Mrs. Ruth. Just a child. And Daisy, you better go now. But I didn't say nothing wrong. What's the harm in a glass of wine? She lies in wait as for a prey. And increase at the transgressors among men. Oh, I don't know what you mean. I never heard such nonsense. You call Holy Scripture nonsense? So what I prayed against is true. You are beyond salvation. It's not so. I'm a good girl, I am, and I won't have you saying. Daddy, please go into the front room. It's quite all right, Mrs. Bunting. I must be going upstairs anyway. I'm used to being misunderstood, you know. People never realize that my efforts are simply for the greatest good of humanity. Of course, sir. And that the power on high will direct my hand toward the expulsion of all evil. Daisy, does he listen to me? Yes. I've got to tell you about... About... About what, Mother Ellen? Nothing. I've got to go out for a while now. I'll be back. The moment to reveal the secret horror had come again and passed. Ellen's sudden recollection of Mr. Sleuth as he stood in the doorway had overwhelmed her. She must give him this last chance, this last frantic search for this proving evidence, this trip to the inquest. If that chance should fail, then she would tell Bunting or the police. So with the knowledge that Bunting was left in the house to look after Daisy, she boarded the underground train bound for the coroner's court. But as the train pulled away from the station, a new torture came to her, began to mount in her mind. It was the sudden realization that provided Sleuth was the murderer, she was equally responsible for his crimes. She had been giving him protection. Protection, 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 protection. If anything should happen to Daisy, she would be equally guilty. Guilty, 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 guilty. Fully as guilty as the Avenger. Ellen, seated at the rear of the small but crowded inquest room, listened to each of the witnesses as they were called. And from one of them, she found the first hope she had known for many days. This witness lived next to the alley in which the Avenger had committed his crime that night. She had seen him from her window, and the man she described in no way resembled Ellen's lodger. But in another moment, Ellen's hope was swept away. It was pointed out that the fog had been so heavy that night that the witness could not possibly have seen the murderer from her window. She left the stand, replaced by a Mr. Cannot. This elderly gentleman was certain that he had not only seen, but talked with the Avenger. It was in Regent's Park, he testified, only a few moments before... A few moments before the murder, Mr. Coroner, when I saw him, he was quite a tall man, very gaunt-looking, and carrying a handbag. A handbag, you say? Yes, a small, narrow one. Just such a bag, I might add, as might contain a knife. <laughs> As Ellen heard these words, the tension which had been mounting up within her became almost unbearable. Rigid with horror, she gripped the arms of her chair. She heard the coroner. I shall have to ask for more order in the court. And now, Mr. Cannon, I understand you heard this man speak. Oh, yes. He had a rather high, hesitating voice. An educated man, I would judge, but quite mad. What do you mean by that? Well, as he emerged from the fog, he was talking aloud to himself. Believe me, sir. He was reciting scriptures from the Bible. Scriptures from the Bible. Horrified, Ellen rose from her seat, only half hearing the confusion about her. Are you asking us to believe? I would say, Mr. Cannon, that the man we're looking for would be least of all a religious man. And that's where you're in error, Mr. Coronet. The religious note is the very key to the case. Very interesting. That'll be all, Mr. Cannon. Uh, just a moment, sir. Don't you understand? The man you're after must be a religious maniac. That's the only explanation possible. You will please stand down. 
caught was dismissing the very truth. Erin knew that now. She would no longer keep silent. Her hand shot forth and she screamed. I, I want to say... Not an bunting on the verge of speaking had fainted. And then, when she was revived a few moments later, she said nothing. Her brain was in too great a turmoil. Her nerves too shocked. Like one in a dream, she allowed herself to be led from the courtroom. The voices of spectators were only vague sounds. I thought she was going to say something. Yes, it was hysteric. Say. Yeah, that bit about the knife. Yeah, yeah. The, the knife. knife. The knife. The knife. The knife. As Ellen Bunting proceeded home with the remarks from the spectators remained in her mind, she heard them over and over. That bit about the knife. No, just such a bag as might contain a knife. We'll see. She stays closer than the house, eh? No harm in being safe. Direct my hand toward the expulsion of all evil. Expulsion of all evil. What's the harm in a glass of wine? I didn't say nothing more. As Ellen neared her neighborhood, her dread increased. With each moving footstep, the grip of terror grew tighter, tighter about her. She moved faster, faster. If only she were in time. She was two streets away from the house. Then one. Then... Then she saw Bunty. Sharply, like the thrust of a knife, she realized what this meant. Daisy was left alone with the lodger. Bunting! Bunting! Yes, yes, what is it? Oh, Bunting, tell me, Bunting. Where's Daisy? Where is she? I say, where? Where? Well, home. What? Oh, listen to me. Try to understand. Sleuth is the Avenger. What are you saying? Oh, Lodger, he is the Avenger, Bunting. Oh, but there's no time for that. Daisy's in danger. Hurry! Hurry! Yes. Daisy! <laughs> Daisy! Here we are, Bunting. Here we are. Daisy! Oh, Daisy! Daisy, Daisy where are you? I look in the kitchen, Bunting. You try the sitting room. <laughs> not here. What about the dining room? Look, she's not there. She's not downstairs. Then there's just his room. Go on. Open the door. Cut. What's the idea here? Have a few more lines to do. As Mr. Marshall, the narrator, you have. Not as Mr. Sleuth, the well, lodger. Hit, you can't stop the play right here. It isn't fair, you know. Why isn't it, Bart? What more is there to say? For Mr. Hitchcock. Won't people want to know what Gunting and me found in the room? All right, Ellen. What precisely did you find? Well, uh, nothing, sir. There. You see? Nothing. No lodger, no Bible. And that locked dresser drawer. What about that? We unlocked it, sir. And what was in it? Nothing, sir. You are certain, Mrs. Bunting? Oh, 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 you gave me quite a turn, Mr. Sleuth. I mean, Mr. Marshall. Uh, yes, sir, I'm sure, sir. There was nothing. I'm well, begging your pardon, Mr. Richcock, but don't you think we'd better just mention about Daisy? I don't know, Bunting. What do you think we ought to say? Oh, just that the reason she wasn't in the house when Ellen and me got there was... Well, she'd gone out for a walk, that's all. Did she enjoy it? Oh, very much, sir. Maybe the King's Cross and back in just under the narrow stuff. Splendid time, Bunting. Well, there you are, Bart. There's the story. Now, wait a minute, Mr. Hitchcock. You can't do that. That's not the story. Of course it's not. I look here, Hitch. Here's the fellow who composed and conducted all our music, Wilbur Hatch. He wants to know about this, too. Everybody does. All right, Bart. What is it they want to know? What became of Mr. Sleuth? Oh, him. Why, he left that afternoon. They never saw him again. And now I think we ought to say something about the Columbia forecast Mr. show Mr. For... will you please... Stop him, uh... Mr. Marshall. Hitch, listen to me. Yes? What is it? They want to know when the Avenger finally was caught. Oh, well, let me ask you something, Bart. Are you acquainted with Loretta Young? Yes, what's that got to do with it? Well, in next week's Columbia preview series, Miss Young will take the starring role in the drama of an American Red Cross nurse. That's good news, isn't it? Oh, that's great. But now listen, Hitch... You've just got to tell that audience exactly when and how Mr. Sleuth was caught. Caught? 
Why on earth should he be caught? Why? Well, he was the Avenger, wasn't he? Was he? Your guess, gentle listener, is as good as ours. Even Mrs. Bella Glowns, who wrote the novel, isn't entirely sure. For his masterful direction, our thanks to Alfred Hitchcock, whose latest pictures are David O. Selznick's Rebecca and Walter Wanger's Foreign Correspondent. For his superb characterization of Mr. Sleuth, our thanks to Herbert Marshall. And our thanks to the outstanding British character actor, who tonight portrayed the role of Bunting, Edmund Gwen. If you liked tonight's program and want to hear more in the same highly original Hitchcock vein, radio versions of The Lady Vanishes and The 39 Steps, for example, write to CBS and tell us so. Your interest will help bring suspense to the air as a weekly feature. Forecast next week presents, from Hollywood, Loretta Young in Angel, first of a proposed series based on the adventures and the romance of a typical Red Cross nurse. From New York, a new sort of comedy show, Ed Gardner as Archie in Duffy's Tavern, with Gertrude Neeson, Colonel Stoopnagel, Larry Adler, and John Kirby's orchestra. Don't miss Forecast at this hour next week. Thomas Freebans is speaking. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Columbia Network takes pleasure in bringing you Suspense. from the world's great literature of pure excitement. A new series frankly dedicated to your horrification and entertainment. Week by week, from the pick of new materials, from the pages of best-selling novels, from the theater of Broadway and London, and the sound stages of Hollywood, will parade the most remarkable figures ever known. CBS gives you... Suspense. Tonight's presentation is one of the finest of the contemporary stories of mystery and terror. John Dixon Carr's famous novel, The Burning Court. Ah, a glass of sherry by the fireside of a beautiful suburban home. What could be more comforting? You're an admirable host, Mr. Depard. And it's really a shame our first meeting is under such a cloud. It's also a shame I have so little time to tell you which one of your guests here... Ah, murdered your uncle last week. Now, let's see now. I believe we're all here. Your wife. Your friend, Mr. Stevens, Captain Brennan. Yes, and incidentally, yourself. Just who did you say you were? Well, no wonder you've had so much difficulty with the case, Captain. My name is Cross, Godin Cross, the writer. As a matter of fact, it's because of my just-completed book, Poisoning Throughout the Ages, that I happen to be here now. And Ted Stevens there happens to be a member of the firm which publishes my work. I'd never seen him until tonight, but I've been told what happened... This afternoon, he began reading my manuscript for the first time on the train. The commuter's train, which every afternoon deposits him safely and soundly here in Christmas. I imagine he was halfway home by the time he finished the first chapter. Then he turned a page. Attached to the following leaf was a picture. And looking at it, the young man stiffened suddenly and all but cried out his shock. It was a picture of a young woman. And under it had been printed, Famous Poisoner Marie Dobre, 1676. 
Ted Stevens was looking at a picture of his own wife. Imagine, imagine his 25-year-old wife in 17th century costume. The face, the features, even a wistfulness of expression were identical. Even the name, Dobray was his wife's maiden name. But no, 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 that was ridiculous. This woman in the picture was, well, one of his wife's ancestors. Yes, that was it, that was it. Simply an amazing family resemblance. Marie would be waiting for him at the station. He'd have to tell her about it. He wondered why, however, she'd never told him about it. Oh, well, but you don't discuss such an ancestor, do you? Ted Stevens glanced down at the chapter to which the picture had been attached. It was entitled, The Affair of the Non-Dead Woman. Hello, Ted. Stevens was almost jolted from his seat. It was Dr. Weldon, professor of English at the college, an old friend of his. Quickly, he thrust the picture beneath the manuscript and moved over. Hi, I didn't see you, Doc. Oh, here, have a seat. Oh, I thought maybe you were giving me the, uh, what are they called? The brush off? Oh, no, I... Uh, say, as a matter of fact, Doc, you're the one man I do want to see. Yeah? Very flattering. Remember those discussions we used to have about murder? <laughs> Better than bridge any time. Well, I got the idea that you'd made sort of a hobby out of the old cases, the historical ones. Well, I've studied quite a number of them, yes. Ever hear of a woman named Marie Dobray? Marie Dobray? Marie Dobray. Oh, yes. Uh, that was her maiden name, of course. One of the finest specialists in arsenic poisoning you could ever hope to find. Oh, we're almost at our station, Ted. Let's get to the door. Yes, a real charmer Marie was. Must have disposed of half a hundred husbands, lovers, suitors, and just plain friends before she was caught. Uh, what happened to her, Doc? She was beheaded and burned. Chris Ben! Oh, absurd. Laughable. Ted Stevens kept saying this to himself, and yet... What he knew was a foolish dread followed him straight through the small suburban station and clung to him as he reached the street. And there in the roadster was Marie, leaning toward him a little to hold the door open and smiling at him. Oh, Ted, what on earth are you staring at? That streetlight shining on your hair, I like that. Oh, you're tight. Come on, get in the car. Then, like a wisp of smoke, it was gone. The whole ridiculous fear. The delusion. When at home, Marie brought the cocktails into the living room. The logs were burning brightly in the fireplace, throwing a soft, dancing glow upon a room that was darkening with dusk. To you, Marie. And to you, dear. As Stevens placed his glass down, he noticed the manuscript of my book. It was there on the table, right where he placed it when he first came in. Deliberately, he turned from it. And then turned back. The manuscript had been moved. Only an inch or so, but it had been moved. Keeping his back to his wife, he thrummed through that early chapter and discovered, just as he knew he would, that the photograph was gone. <laughs> For a long moment, he thought of what to do. Then slowly, he turned around. This book by Cross I brought home. Yes? Uh, there was a story of a poisoner in it. It's rather funny. Her name happens to be the same as yours. Oh, your maiden name, that is. Oh, that is odd, isn't it? <laughs> Darling, was she a relative of yours? Why, Ted, you're serious. In a way, yes. Oh, I don't mean it's really important. It's just that... Well, when you run across a person who's a dead ringer for your own wife and who lived 300 years ago and was a top-flight poisoner, well, you like to hear about it, that's all. What on earth are you talking about? Darling, be honest with me. Didn't you look at this manuscript when I was out of the room? No. You didn't take out a picture of a poisoner named Marie de Bay? I most certainly did not. Oh, Ted, 
What is this all about? Who are you getting at? Well, just this. Somebody took that picture out of that manuscript since I've been home. Now, who's that? Well, I'll take a look. Wait, I don't feel like... Why, it's Mark Sitar. Mark? Ted, wait a second. Yes? Ted, whatever it is he wants, promise you won't do it. Promise I won't do I it? I mean, promise you won't get yourself involved. Please, Ted, don't go out tonight. Hey, what in the world is... Well, anyway, we can't let him stay outside. Mark, how are you? Come on in. Thanks, sir. You're thinking about giving you a call later. Oh, let me have your hat. Oh, thanks. I, Marie, I, I hope you'll excuse me for popping in like this, but, well, I wanted to talk to Ted. It, it's rather important. Oh, I don't mind at all. Come on, Mark. We'll step into the library. Oh, you mind, dear? Of course not, Ted. I'll be making sandwiches for us. Oh, grab that chair in the corner, Mark. Well, let's hear it. What's trouble, Ted? My Uncle Miles was murdered. Murdered? Oh, the talk hasn't reached you yet. But it's already started. Nothing definite, of course. Just that there was something wrong about Uncle Miles' death. But I don't... Mark, are you sure of this? You know he was murdered? I don't know. Of course I don't. I just don't see how it could be any other way. Uncle Miles, you know, had been sick for quite a while. But last Saturday, he seemed so much better that Miss Corbett, uh, that was his nurse, decided to take the day off. And, oh, well, you know all this... You and Marie were over that afternoon. Anyway, Lucy and I went to the club that night, to that masquerade party, and we left the old boy completely alone. I've cursed myself a thousand times since. But what about your housekeeper, Mrs., uh, what's her name? Henderson. Wasn't she around? Oh, sure. In that little house out in back. We told her to look in now and then, but, well, that wasn't good enough. It was after midnight when Lucy and I got back. Uncle Miles was dying. Ted, it looked exactly like one of his regular attacks. But then later, after he was gone, I happened to glance under the chest of drawers in his room. There was a small silver cup under there, almost drained, and Uncle Miles' cat. The cat was still warm, but quite dead. Oh. I managed to get the cat out of the house and buried without anyone seeing me. Next day, I had the contents of the cup analyzed. It was poison? Yes. Arsenic. Well, what do you want me to do? Help me open the crypt. What? I want to have a private autopsy performed. Help me get Uncle Miles' body out of that vault. Oh, I know it's a tough job. The thing is sealed solid, but we can do it. You mean without the police knowing about it? Without anybody knowing about it. Mrs. Henderson visiting her sister, and I managed to send Lucy over to the club. You must be crazy. You're playing with dynamite, Mark. This is something you've got to tell the police now. I can't take that chance. But they'll have to know sometime. You're only... I've got to know first, I tell you. You don't understand, Ted. There was somebody in Uncle Miles' room that night. Handing him something in a silver cup. Mrs. Henderson was on the porch by the window. She saw her. She saw her? Ted. She thinks it was my wife. Oh, Lucy. It doesn't mean anything to Mrs. Henderson yet. Because she doesn't suspect anything. But, well... Ted, you've got to see why I've got to be sure. Why I've got to know how Uncle Miles died. Because it wasn't Lucy, Ted. I know it wasn't. Of course not, Mark. She had an alibi. Well, she was with you at the club, wasn't she? Yes. Except for half an hour. I see. You'll help me, won't you, Ted? When do we start? As soon as you can make it. Okay. Come on now. I'll get your hat. You try on a hat and I'll come over as soon as I can see Marie. You're not going to tell her about that. Of course not. I'll think of something. Don't you worry about it. No, thanks, Ted. Thanks a lot. Uh, Marie? I'm coming. Uh, darling, uh, Mark asked me to, uh... I know, Ted. Here. You better take your sandwiches with you. You'll be hungry. Oh, but... You knew I was going out? Yes, I knew. You listened to us? I couldn't help it, Ted. I had an idea what Mark's visit was about. To talk about his uncle's death. There's a lot of talk about it in the village. That's why I tried to tell you why I didn't want you to get mixed up in it. But it's too late now, isn't it? I mean, you're going. I can tell by the way you look. Ted, wait a second. There's just one thing I want to tell you before you leave. And that is that no matter what happens, no matter what you find or think or believe, I love you. You'll remember that, won't you? I'll remember you said so, Marie. <laughs> Mm. 
By the light of a dim kerosene lantern, Mark and Ted Stevens pounded their way through the thick shelf of rock that covered the Depar's ancestral tomb. Pried open the great slab of stone which lay across the subterranean door, and then at last descended to the dank ink black chamber. They found the coffin. They dragged it from its crypt and placed it on the cold stone floor. They unclamped the lid and opened it. Mark! It can't be. What? That's impossible. It can't be. But it is, Mark. You know what this means? That body wasn't in this coffin when it was placed here. I'll swear it was, Ted. From the time that coffin was closed on Uncle Miles, somebody, the undertaker or Lucy or me, somebody was with it until it was buried. And the crypt was sealed right after. Then somebody beat us to it. Somebody's broken in here ahead of us. Broken in? Listen, Ted. Lucy and I have hardly left the house since the funeral. Do you think anybody could break in here? Smash through that stone and cement without our seeing them? Or without our hearing them? Well, well. What? Well, you might as well come on up and... But who is that? Me, Mr. Depard, up here. My name's Captain Brennan. I'm from the office of the Commissioner of Police. I'm the... I'd like to talk to you, if you don't mind, Mr. Depard. Here, uh, follow my flashlight up. But I don't understand. Uh, how did you... How did you know about this? By listening, Bingley. Do you mind if we go up to your house, Mr. Depard? Why, no. <laughs> Not at all. Oh, thank you. Oh, Freddie. Uh, look here, Captain. I... Uh, Freddie, this is Mr. Depa, Lieutenant Gray. How do you know you, Mr. Depa. And Mr. Uh, Ted Stevens, is it? Well, how did you... How did you know my name? Very simple. I got the names of everybody who was here at the Depa the day the old man died. You and your wife were included. Oh, here we are. But I don't... Uh, uh, Captain, who gave you those names? Why, your housekeeper, of course. Mrs. Henderson? You didn't think Mrs. Henderson saw the dead cat, did you, Mr. Depa? But she did. She also saw you bury it. And uh, we've been interested in the case ever since. Well, nice place you have here, Mr. Depard. Now, let's see. According to Mrs. Henderson, your wife was wearing some kind of a masquerade costume that night. What kind of a thing was it? Well, it was... A... Oh, there, you can see it. It was copied from the dress in that old painting over there. Oh, yes. Yeah. Hmm. Funny, uh, where's the woman's face? It's always been that way. Long as I can remember. Somebody must have thrown acid on it or something. <laughs> Can't blame them much. She was a poisoner. A poisoner? Yes. The story goes that one of my ancestors was responsible for her execution. Marie Dobre, her name was. Oh, yes. I have read about it. Learned all the poison tricks from one of her lovers, guy by the name of Godass de Croix. Godass de... Oh, yes, Mr. Stevens. We cops read now and then. <laughs> did, did you say Godass de Croix? That's French. We call it cross. Ah, absolutely no limit to a cop's education, is there? <laughs> but to uh, get back to your wife, Mr. Depart, she was just like the famous Marie. Now, when Mrs. Henderson looks through that window... Just a minute, Captain. Mrs. Henderson can't prove she saw a thing, and you know it. Now, what do you mean? I mean you haven't any right to insinuate that my wife was in that room. Well, who's insinuating? I, I'm trying to say that Mrs. Henderson, after thinking it over, realized that she was kicked by the costume. The woman she saw in the funny clothes, handing a cup of poison to your uncle, wasn't your wife at all. What? Because your wife is an unusually tall young woman. And the one Mrs. Henderson saw was fully half a head shorter. More on the order, let's say, of uh, Mr. Stevens' wife. My wife? Captain, Why, this is absolutely ridiculous. Well, I don't know. It's... All right, what's the matter, Mr. Stevens? You're something like a leaf. Uh, tell me now, uh, just for fun. Where was Mrs. Stevens that night? She was home with me. The whole evening? Certainly. You retired early? Yes, we both did. You, I suppose, were sound asleep by midnight. Yes, I was. Then how do you know where your wife was? Well, I... Look here, I... Stevens. She had to have a costume that would match Mrs. Dave Paz. How did she manage that? Where did she get it? Well, she, she never had one. She never had a dress like that. And what about our motive? Why did she poison it? Oh, I don't know. Well, for money, certainly. Then what was it? Hate? Did she hate my husband? Oh, yes, yes, she did. No, no. Oh, I, I don't know. I don't know, I tell you. Brown? Yes, Freddy. I phoned and got hold of Mr. Depard in the nurse, all right. Then Mrs. Stevens couldn't reach her. The phone won't answer. Okay, have a picture. I'm going home. Stevens, come back here. I'm going to get my wife. Oh, man, stop it, Brown. Marie, what have you done? Marie, 
Oh. Oh, good evening. Ah, uh, who are you? I? Uh, my name is Cross. Go down, Cross. Cross? Where's my wife? What have you done to her? <laughs> you fiend, what have you done to my wife? You are nothing at all, young man. Here, 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 sit down. You're lying. Something's happened to her. The police just found there wasn't an answer. <laughs> Why are you here? Why am I here? Well... <laughs> Because your wife, reading my chapter on the Dubrays, realized I knew more about the family than even she did. Because she found my phone number on the front cover of the manuscript. And because I know an exceptional case when I hear one. Does that answer your question? No, you know it doesn't. Can't you see I've got to... I've got to know whether... Yeah, I see. Whether your wife is that Marie Dubray, who was burnt. Burnt by order of the High Tribunal for all poison cases. The burning court of France, witchcraft, black magic, the world across the threshold. You're quite sure, no doubt, also, that I'm Godin Saint Croix, who first wooed her. No, no, my boy. <laughs> no, my real name happens to be, of all things, Tom Simpson. Most unsuitable for a distinguished writing career. And Marie Dobray is no more your wife's real name than mine is Godin Cross. What? Your esteemed wife was an adopted child, Mr. Stevens. Adopted by people in Canada named Dobre. Remote members of the real family of poisoners. I can't believe it. Why? Why didn't you tell me? You why? Because until I told her half an hour ago, she didn't know it herself. You see, in the course of my research on the family, I found out about it. And in the course of talking with your wife, I found out something else. How for years she was haunted by the fear that she might be a poisoner by inheritance, by blood. And you can see, can't you, why she never talked about it? Her yes. past to you? Yes, yes. And yet, Mr. Stevens, you had all but made her forget that past. You. And that's why she was willing to lie, to steal a picture, do anything, in order to hold you to her. Yes, yes, I, I see that now. You know, young man, I, I rather think she loves you. But as you will see, though, I, she comes only when I call her. Uh, Mrs. Stevens? You mean she's... Yes, Mr. Cross. Marie, it's you. You're all right? Oh, yes, dear. We're both all right now, and nothing can change it ever. Marie, listen. Do you say Marie, dear? Say Maggie. Maggie? Oh, that's my name, my real name. Maggie McTavish. And it's a lovely name, dear. The most beautiful, gorgeous... Darling, ever. darling, please. You don't understand. The police, they think you had something to do with Miles' death. They think I did. So, now, Mr. Stevens, before we go back to the Depars, don't you think you'd better tell me everything that's been said and done up to date? Having just saved your wife's soul from the burning court, now I'll rest her body from the electric chair. <laughs> yes, Mr. Depar, truly excellent sherry. Don't you think so, Miss Corbett? Yes. It is very nice. Well... That, ladies and gentlemen, is how I happen to be here. So let us consider first that supernatural hocus-pocus in the crypt. That body that walked out of the sealed tomb. That body that never was in the tomb. Never was in the tomb? No, Mr. Depar. The murderer knew that very soon Mrs. Henderson's story would bring about an investigation. He had to get rid of the well-known corpus delicti. Yes, but who could have kept the body out of the tomb? Who, Mr. Depar? Why, you, sir. What? Oh, no, what heck? <laughs> I, I don't understand. Well, it's very simple. You had the opportunity. I believe you said yourself you were alone with the body before the burial. And you had the strength. I dare say you carried it down to the furnace. Where it's now, probably nothing but ashes. Ridiculous. Why would he spend an hour smashing into a crypt for a body he knew wasn't there? Why, Captain? Hmm. To impress Mr. Stevens, his witness. And also, apparently, you. Oh, that's perfectly fantastic. Fantastic. Oh, no, Lucy. Just comic. And I suppose, Mr. Croft, that I also put on a woman's masquerade costume, went into my uncle's room and handed him a nice cup of arsenic. No, no, no. That had to be done by a woman. Your accomplice, as a matter of fact. Oh, now, come, come, come. You mustn't all look at Mrs. Depar, because Mark Depar's one noble act was his frantic effort to prevent his wife from being charged with the crime. A crime which he and nurse Myra Corbett committed. Myra Corbett? Why, you... Yes, sir. Yes, Mr. Stevens. This quiet little lady beside but, me. Well, why would I do such a thing? Money, Miss Corbett. A cutout of Mark Depar's inheritance. Payments for but, services rendered. That's an absolute lie, Corbett. You see, ladies and gentlemen, Captain Brennan never bothered to check Miss Corbett's whereabouts on the night of the murder. 
Why even think of the nurse? She was the custodian of the old man's health. Oh, you're crazy, you're crazy. And yet who but a nurse could so naturally offer the old man a cup? A cup he was sure contained medicine. You're making it up. And who but Miss Corbett, living right here in this house, would know what kind of masquerade dress she must copy, would know when Mrs. Henderson would pass the window that night, pass and see her, and accept her, she hoped, for Lucy Depart. No, that's not true. Oh, yes, Miss Corbett, yes, Miss Corbett, that dress was the touch that wrecked you. That was your own idea, wasn't it, not Mark? You weren't content with a mere murderer's share of the profit. You wanted a white share, half of the whole estate. You wanted Lucy Depart convicted and out of the way for good. Mm. Well, I give you a toast, Miss Corbett, with Mr. Depart's excellent sherry. To a particularly ruthless poisoner. And yet, you know, on the whole, I'm rather partial to female poisoners. Why, only tonight I... I... <coughs> Cyanide, if I know anything. Cyanide from that glass of sherry. Cyanide that a nurse could get quite easily. That glass was right beside you, Miss Corbett, and nobody else was near it. Too bad he didn't drink it as soon as you hoped. A second ago, we had nobody to use against you. But we have now, Miss Corbett. We have now. And I arrest you for the murder of Gordon Cross. <laughs> I'm in here, dear. Oh, oh. I thought you might. Well, what did you cut it off for? Huh? What do you mean? The radio. Oh. Oh, yeah. Well, I thought you wanted to talk. Poor Ted. Don't you think I know you better than that? What was on the radio? Well, there wasn't a... Okay. It's about Myra Corbett. She goes to the chair tonight. Oh. I didn't think you wanted to be reminded. I don't, really. But making such an effort to hide it only keeps it alive, doesn't it? All right, darling. You know what I came in to ask? If you wanted a cocktail before dinner? The largest one you've got. Fine, I'll get out the ice cube. I know. If I'll fix up the fire. Okay, Maria. A deal. Uh, where are some papers to start it? <laughs> right there by the bookcase. And the name's not Marie. It's Maggie. Because, darling, Marie's dead and gone forever. kind, darling. Any kind at all. You've just heard The Burning Court from John Dixon Carr's famous novel, the first in Columbia's new series of outstanding classics and chills by world-famous authors. Tonight's play, ladies and gentlemen, has one rather special significance we think you'd like to know about. As you perhaps have heard, every fine comedian is said to cherish a secret desire to do an abrupt about face. He pines for the part of a blackguard. Well, tonight you witness the fulfillment of one such desire. The role of that literary and quite infamous diehard Gordon Cross was portrayed by none other than Hollywood's expert provoker of laughs, Charlie Ruggles, given the York for the world premiere of his latest screen success, Friendly Enemies. 
The role of Marie? Well, that was enacted by a young lady who long ago won national acclaim as one of Broadway's most accomplished dramatic actresses, Miss Julie Hayden. Thank you, Charlie Ruggles and Miss Julie Hayden, for your splendid performances. The play tonight, as all plays in this series, was produced and directed by Charles Vander, written by Harold Medford and scored by Bernard Herman. Next week, we bring you an intensely exciting and moving drama, The Life of Nellie James. This is, this is the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Columbia Network takes pleasure in bringing you... Suspense. Suspense. A new series of programs with one strict purpose in view. Your entertainment. Each week at this time, CBS sets aside 30 minutes to excite you, to mystify you, and on occasion to horrify you with a catalog of the world's great thrillers. Dramas from the stage and screen, from fiction and radio. Dramas that bring you... The Fence. This, the second offering of a new series, is a unique one. Certainly, it is one of the very few pieces of suspense literature that somehow manages to tickle your funny bone while busily engaged in tingling your spine. Make no mistake, though, nobody's kidding. CBS presents its adaptation of John Collier's well-known short story, Wet Saturday. Yes, it's a wet Saturday. Never saw it rain harder. I'm Princey, Frederick Princey, just an ordinary family man. I have a son, a daughter, and a wife. I might be out golfing now if it hadn't been for the... Hi, Mrs. Princey. I plan to drive over to the nursery this afternoon for some arbiters. The borders, you know. But... Oh, the whole lot of them make me sick. Yes, I'm George, son and heir. <laughs> I had a date to go punting. Punting. Couldn't find the blasted pumpkin in the weather, so I'm home too. I. I'm Millicent. I was going to play croquet. That's how I. Happy to have the mallet. Yes, that's the Princey family. We find them at home. Mrs. Princey, Millicent, George sprawled on a couch, Mr. Princey biting on a dry pipe. Their living room is dull and overstuffed. Rain beats at the windows. They are any middle-class family at home on a wet day, except for one small item. As you sit with them in the living room, you can see through the door to the sun porch a pair of men's feet encased in black boots. They look like the feet of a curate. There's a tenseness in the room. The air is charged with excitement, but the feet are very Still. Don't keep staring at them. Listen to me, all of you. Don't you see? They'd hang her. That's what they do. They'd hang her. Oh, Fred, it's too awful. Awful? Catastrophic? A supposedly sweet, gentle, intelligent girl, respected, loved by the whole village, doing a thing like this. Think of the publicity of this disgrace. You think I'm going to resign from the bench to best it? Hell out and live in some foggy hotel abroad. Oh, no, no. No. No, I kill myself. I will. I will. Don't be a fool. Any more than you have been, the governor being. Be quiet. Wouldn't be so bad if it were you. Everybody in the village knows you're not responsible. George. Yes? Get off that couch. Sit up on your spine. Oh. You might be of a little use here if you could think. Listen, Governor, this isn't my funeral. Oh, shut up. As long as I can remember, George, 
You've been a trial and a tribulation to me. Oh, I can't stand it. I can't stand it. You've got to stand it, my dear. And keep that hysterical note out of your voice. You hear? Yes. We are... <clears throat> we are talking about the weather. Now, George. Yeah? George. If he fell down the old well, say, uh, striking his head several times, what about it, eh? I really don't know, Governor. What about it? Don't be an ass. I'm asking you to think. He'd have had to hit the side several times in 30 or 40 feet and, and at all the correct angles. Now, no, I'm afraid not. I'm afraid not. We'll have to go over it all again. Oh, no, Father. No, no. I couldn't. I couldn't. Millicent, we must go over it all again. Oh, Fred, you're torturing her. Oh, face facts, Mater. With him lying there, there's no use pretending it's a picnic. <laughs> they might hang you, Millicent. Oh, stop that shaking. Stop it here. You must stop it. Keep your voice quiet. Millicent, we are talking of the weather. Now, we will proceed. I can't. I can't. Oh, shoot have both of those boots, Millie. <laughs> I'm not moving them. Well, sit up, George. Stop shuffling your feet. Now, Millicent, look at me. Answer me truthfully, you hear? Answer me. You were in the croquet court. Yes. Who knew you were in love with this wretched curate? Who? Uh -huh. oh, the whole village. <laughs> They've been sniggering about it at the pub for three years. Ah, what a Millicent, we continue. You were on the croquet court. Yes. You were putting the croquet set into its box. Yes. It, it was starting to rain. I was carrying the balls and mattress into the front porch. The box was there. You heard someone enter the garden gate and come across the yard? Yes. Could you see who it was? Oh, not at first. I was going into the front porch. I threw down all the mallets but the red one and turned around. It was with us. Yes. So you called him. Loudly? Did you call him loudly? Could anyone have heard? No, Father, I'm sure not. I didn't really call him. I I just spoke his name. He saw me as I went to the door. He just waved his hand and came over. How can I find out from you whether there was anyone about? Whether he could have been seen? I'm sure not, Father. I'm, I'm quite sure. So... You both went into the front porch. Yes. It was raining hard then. What did he say? He said, Hello, Millie. And excuse his coming in the back way, but he set out to walk over to Liston. Yes. And he said, Passing the park, he seen the house, suddenly thought of me. And he thought he'd just look in for a moment. He, he had something to tell me. Go on. He said he was so happy. He wanted me to share it. He heard from the bishop he was to have a vicarage. And it wasn't only that. It meant he could marry. Uh, then he began to stuff and get all confused. And of course, I thought he meant me. Don't tell me what you thought. Tell me exactly what he said, nothing else. Well... you can no longer afford. Tell me what happened. He said, no. He said it, it wasn't me. Really. It's Ella Bragdon Davis. And, and he was sorry. And, and all that. Then he went to go. And then? I went back. He turned his back. 
I had the red mallet of the croquet set in my hand. I forgot to drop it in the box when he came. I... Did you shout or scream? I mean, as you hit him? No. no. I'm sure I didn't. Did he? Come on, speak up. No, Father. And then? I threw it down. I came straight in here. I went to look for Mother. Oh, poor baby. No. No, I will leave the child no. alone, Fred. Not such a child, Mater. Oh, Millie, I had no idea Keep you had... quiet. I'm thinking. Hmm. You see, George, he probably told people he was going to Liston. Certainly no one knows he came here, for he, he didn't decide until he crossed the park. He might have been attacked in the woods. We must consider every detail. A curate with his head battered in. Don't, Father. Don't. A curate, head battered in. Now, who would want to kill with us? Oh, kill with us? Well, I would with Decker. How do you do, Mrs. Princey? Captain, Captain Smith. Oh, sit down, pray. Mustn't get up for me, Mrs. Princey. You either listen to my words. Just being neighborly on a bad day. I wanted to ask you about those daily abounds, Princey. Took a shortcut on account of the rain and walked right in. Knew you wouldn't mind. Oh, he heard you, Father. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we can all have our little jokes. <laughs> Don't pretend to be shocked. Uh, this, this way, Smollett. This, this chair facing the fireplace. Sit down, Mother. Oh, just uh, straighten the curtains for the sun porch, dear. It looks so gloomy out there. Might as well shut the rain oh, out. Just talking about a little theoretical cure. Killing Smollett. <laughs> you know, young people these days like thrillers. Pass on his side. Justifiable pass on his side. Have you heard about Ella Bragdon Davis? I shall be most properly laughed at. Why? Why should you be laughed at, Smollett? No, I'm a shot in that direction myself. <laughs> they are said yes, too. Haven't you heard? She told most people. Now it'll look as if I got turned down for a white rat in a dog collar. Oh, too bad. Oh, fortune of war. Yeah, fortune of war. Odd how it happens, isn't it? <laughs> Sit down, Smollett. Millicent, console Captain Smollett with your, your best light conversation. You too, Mother. George and I have something to look at outside. This is rain, you know, but it is bad, very bad. Uh, come, George. Right, old governor. Maybe we'll need raincoats. What? Oh, I don't think so. Uh, just make yourself at home, Smollett. Make yourself at home. A cigarette, Captain Smollett? Thank you. Thank you. Oh, not the day to be going out. Something about the old well. Just off the Sunforge door, you know. The terrible sodden weather seems to have loosened some of the stones. Oh, too bad. Dash too bad. Spoils the tennis and croquet, I mean, a day like this. Doesn't it, Millie? Doesn't it, Millie? Mm. Oh, yes, it does. She was practicing out on the croquet court earlier, but, uh, oh, do pull your chair nearer the fire, Captain. It was so damp, we thought it would be cozy to light it. Thank you, I'm quite comfortable. I, uh, I hope you don't feel too bad about her, David. Can't always win. Can't say, though, what you women see in these bloodless clerics. Oh, I always thought Mr. Withers was a, he is a very charming man. Quite agree, but why should anyone want to marry him? You wouldn't want to marry him, would you, Millie? Not now. Very is that. Are you? Oh. Oh, no. Oh, God. Molly. <laughs> yes. Yes, thank you. Good Lord, man, you... You come in on a fellow suddenly. <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> oh, don't mind this old double barrel shotgun. Been working on it. Smollett, may I have your attention for a minute? There's something on the sun porch I'd like to show you. Why, yes. Yes, of course. Smollett, George and I went out to see if we could shoot some rats which have been driven out of the old well by the high water. They might get into the house. Now, you must listen to me very carefully. Very carefully, or you will be shot by accident. Princey, what got into you? You heard me ask as you came in who would kill with us? 
You also heard Millicent make a comment. An unguarded comment. Well, what of it? Very little. Unless you were to hear that Withers had met a violent end this very afternoon. And that, my dear Smollett, is what you are going to hear. What? Withers? Yes. Who killed him? Millicent. Good Lord. Yes, it's a mess. And of course, you would have remembered and guessed. Maybe, yes. Yes, I... Yes, I I suppose I should. Therefore, you constitute a problem. Why did she kill him? Oh, it's one of those disgusting things. Pitiable, too. She deluded herself that he was in love with her. Good heavens, Lily. Oh, yes, of course. I I see. He had told her about the Davis girl. I understand. Now, I have no wish, as you will comprehend, that she should be proved either a lunatic or a murderer. I could hardly go on living here after that. Suppose not. On the other hand, you know about it. Yes, I see that makes me a problem. <laughs> You're wondering if I could keep my mouth shut. If I promise... I am wondering if I could believe you. But if I promise... If things went smoothly, yes. But not if there was any sort of suspicion, any questioning. You would be afraid of being an accessory. Why, I don't know. I do. What are we going to do? I can't see anything else. You, you'd never be fool enough to do me in. You, you can't get rid of two corpses. Oh, I regard it as a better risk than the other. It could be an accident. Or you and Wither could both disappear. There are possibilities in that. Listen, you, you can't. I can, but there may be a way out. There is. Smollett, you gave it to me yourself. I, I did what? You said you would kill with us. You have a motive. Look oh, here, I, I was joking. Of course you saw that. You are always joking. Listen, Smollett, I can't trust you. You must trust me. Else I will kill you now in the next minute. I mean that you can choose between dying and living. Go on. Now there's the old well just outside the front porch door. That's where I'm going to put with us. No one outside knows he has come up here this afternoon. No one will ever look there for him unless you tell them. You must give me evidence that you have murdered with us. I murdered him? Why do you want that? So that I shall be dead sure that you will never open your lips on the subject. I see. What evidence? George, hit him in the face. Sure. Keep out of it. Uh, Captain, you should be more careful. Look what your teeth did to my knuckles. Again, George. Okay. Oh, I can't stand this. Hold on. Keep quiet. You women, keep out of it. I'm sorry, Smollett, but there must be traces of a struggle between you and Withers. Then it will not be altogether safe for you to go to the police. But, but can't you take my word, man? I will when we are finished. George, yes? get the cokey, Mary. Right, Governor. Take your handkerchief to it. In there, on the sun porch floor. Yes. Yes, I got it, Governor. There, Captain. There's the weapon. As I told you, Smollett. Now, you'll just grasp the end that mashed with us head. I shall shoot you if you don't. But good Lord, you can't. All right. There. That. I'll deposit it out by the side of the house, out of the rain, of course. No, wait, George. Uh-huh. First, you'd better pull a few hairs out of his head and put them under the nails of Wither's right hand. Uh-huh. Prince, have you gone mad? Do you know what you're doing? With this gun? Yes. Go ahead, George. <laughs> Sorry to mush your hair up, Captain. Uh-huh. Oh, shut up, Smollett. There. That's all we need. Now, for Withers, we'll fix it right up. Be right with you, Governor. Smollett, you may turn around. Withers is just there in the sun porch. Draw back the curtain. Good Lord, Prince. Yes, messy. But we'll get him fixed up. Now, you, Smollett, you've just got to drag him through the door and dump him in the old well. (laughs) 
Just beyond the door, Captain. I, I won't touch him. I won't try. All right. Stand aside. Out of range, George. Right. Only one place I want this bullet to go. Father. Oh, Father. Oh, Keep quiet. My aim's not too good. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I... Yes, I... Better, Monet. Much better. Go on now. In here. You'll have to take him outside. By the shoulders ought to do it, Captain. Be quiet, George. Go on, Monet. Go on. You've seen dead men before. Crack him. Crack him. I'll just hold the gun here to make sure that everything goes on. Oh, Roger, come away from the dim window, dear. Don't look. But Captain Smollett, his father is a very resourceful man, Millicent. I'm sure what he's doing is right. But the Captain, I can't, I can't stand with him. Must not question your dear father. I say, are you two still at it? There's enough trouble around here without blubbering. I'm not blubbering, Dad. <laughs> oh, you see, Smollett, everything is they never looked in our way. You see how crazy it is? I guess it is. Oh, good heavens, man. Look, you're dripping wet. Why, why didn't you slip your raincoat on? <laughs> Tea ready, my dear? In just a minute, dear. I'll bring for Bridget. Exactly what you need, Smollett. Cup of tea. Best thing in the world to ward off a cold. Sit out, won't you? Oh, don't mind getting the chair wet. Sit away. Help yourself. I stick to my pipe, you know. Funny Mr. how... Princey, everything's hot, ma'am. Oh, Bridget, yes. Put the tray in front of me here, on the table. Yes, ma'am. That's it. I say, Captain, you've gone and cut your lip. I just knocked it. Oh, how dreadful. Here, Bridget, yes, give ma'am. the captain this cup. No, oh, no, thank you. I, I, I rather think I've been running along now, if you don't mind. Oh, Captain Smollett, without any tea. Oh, if you don't mind, Mrs. Princey... If I could just have my raincoat. Oh, I'll get it for you, Captain. Oh, this is very distressing. Small, it's very. Oh, I, I'll be all right presently, I'm sure. Here we are. Now, let me help you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, young man. Claire. Better go out the front way, Small. The walk is dry. Oh, let me hold the door for you, Captain. <laughs> don't worry, you fellow. Don't worry at all. Oh, no, no. Oh, no. Nothing serious, I imagine. It'll rest and you'll be as right as rain. By the way, Millicent, you're not looking any too well. No, not well at all. I'm sure it was that croaky cough. Being outdoors in weather like this is simply foolhardy. The maid is right, Millie. You saw what happened to Captain Smollett. Oh, come on, dear. I shall give you a hot foot bath and put you to bed. And a couple of days in bed, and you'll be fine, dear. Get plenty of rest, Millicent, and don't worry about a thing. That's the best job. <sighs> well, I guess I'll have a little rest too, Governor. It's a fine afternoon for a nap. Indeed it is, son. Well, enjoy yourself. I'll see you later. I'll see you all later. <laughs> Oh, would you get me the police station, please? Police station, police station, please. Police station. Was I to wait, sir? Police headquarters, Sergeant Yen speaking. Oh, hello, Sergeant. This is Prince here, Abbot's Road. I, I believe you know me. Sergeant, a horrible thing has just happened. Quite extraordinary. Murder, in, in fact. Murder? I'm afraid it looks rather bad for, well, for, for a close friend of ours, unfortunately. We saw him do it. I, I think you'd better send someone over right away. Rob, and should be there right about now, Mr. Pitney. I, I beg your pardon? I say, our man should be there now. Constable Martin has his post right below your house there. Just rang in. Seems Captain Smollett was with him. Uh, Captain Smollett? They reported some rather queer going down at your place, but I certainly didn't understand it was murder. Just don't touch anything, Mr. Princey, and don't worry. Don't worry at all. No. No, 
no, no. I, I won't, Sarge. Thank you. Governor, Governor, where are you? I'm right. I'm right here. Stop shouting. Oh, we we have some visitors, Governor. Oh, yes. Yes, yes, I, I can see that. Well, Constable, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. Prince. And Smollett, I, I see what a, what a remarkable fellow you are, coming back like this. <laughs> here to reenact the crime? Only oh, the one against me, Prince. The one against the curate I'll leave to you people. <laughs> Extraordinary sense of humor. Mr. Prince, I just had a look at what's in your well. Not to criticize that, not pretty at all. Yes, Captain Smollett was thorough, if nothing else. You saw him when he did it, sir, out in the back? No, quite. We were just returning from a walk. Smollett evidently had been laying for the curate, hiding out in those bushes by the road, I imagine. He was never inside this house. Never. And uh, you say, Captain? I say that while I was inside this house, a guest of the family, I was coerced into dragging the curate's body outside and dumping it in the well. Well, there we are. Uh, not entirely, Constable. Uh, I'll just remove my raincoat. There. And demonstrate how damp I got my clothes when I went outside without it. No. That's interesting, isn't it? <laughs> Quite. <laughs> He undoubtedly removed his coat at some point between here and your post. I might as well tell you that his weapon, a red crooked mallet, is out by the side of the house. I shouldn't be at all surprised, but that you'd find his fingerprints all over it. All over the end of the mallet, Constable. The end that mashed with his head. And not the end I'd have had to grasp in order to do the mashing. Governor, <laughs> that's a decent try, Smollett. <laughs> but it won't work. There must be other evidences, Constable. You'll undoubtedly find them when you examine the body. Oh, he means my hair under Withers' nails. Well, sir, if you look carefully, I believe you'll find a few of my precious hairs under his son's nails, too. Here, what are you trying to... Constable, this is an utter waste of time. So far as the violent struggle between Smollett and Withers is concerned, Smollett's face speaks for itself. Quite eloquently, I believe. Oh, but no more eloquently than your son's knuckles. As you see, Constable, a fresh abrasion. He did that on my teeth. Or did he? What? I say, or did he? He might have done that on Withers' teeth. <laughs> oh, I see. I see what you mean. But, but, but I didn't. The governor, he said I... Oh, keep still, you nitwit. Let me think. Let me think. But as a matter of fact, George, the more I think of it, the more I'm convinced it was your voice I heard. Quite a vigorous quarrel. Something about the curate juicing your sister. Oh, don't be ridiculous, Smollett. Very well, Princey. If your son didn't do it, who did? That's what I'd like to know. How about it, Mr. Princey? Well, that... That is a sticker, all right. <laughs> George, my boy, it looks like you're elected. Elected? What do you mean? I didn't do it. Why, I don't have nothing to your do Keep your mouth shut, will you? I won't. I'm not going to take the blame for her. Millie did it. She did it with that mallet, I saw. You could prove that? Prove it? I... I... Yes. Her, her fingerprints on the mallet. The handle. Why, George, don't you remember when you made me touch the mallet? Oh. When you picked it up with your handkerchief? No, I... George, I'm sure you wiped that handle clean. Oh, well, I could hardly expect you to remember that if you, you can't even remember killing the curate. Governor, I... I told you to keep... Still. But, oh, Governor, you, you, you're not going to turn me over. You, as you're... long as I can remember, George, you've been a trial and a tribulation to me. Governor, I... You shouldn't have done it, son. You really shouldn't. No, George, that was definitely wrong. <laughs> I say, Princey, I think I'll have that cup of tea after all. Nothing like it in weather like this. Wet Saturday... From the short story by John Collier. You have just heard the second in Columbia's new series, a series designed to bring you the best in thrill entertainment. Outstanding dramas from the field of fiction and radio, stage and screen. Dramas of pure... Suspense. This Columbia feature is produced and directed by Charles Vanda, with script by Harold Medford and score by Bernard Herman. Be with us again next week at the same time when we present Suspense. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.
My name is Mary Ann Spitz, and I'm 14 years old. My mother has a defense job, so I do the marketing for our family. Every morning, Mother says to me, Mary Ann, be sure you buy the most for the least money. So lately, I've been buying all the Victory Food Specials. These are marked with a red, white, and blue basket sign with a big red V. The reason I always look for this sign is, well, you have heard the old saying, an army travels on its stomach. I know Uncle Sam needs lots of food to feed our fighting men. An army that that's going places has to have good things to eat. Now, steak fried rare with French with French fried potatoes is my favorite meal. But I'd rather have a soldier eat this dinner than eat it myself, if it will get this war over sooner. So, if you have friends or relatives in the armed forces, think twice before you buy the food they need. Look for the victory specials and help win the war faster. The Columbia Network takes pleasure in bringing you Suspense. Columbia's play theater of outstanding thrillers, produced and directed by William Spear and scored by Bernard Herrmann. The notable melodramas from fiction and stage and screen, from the world's great literature of entertaining excitement, presented each week to bring you to the edge of your chair, to keep you in suspense. Tonight's adventure in suspense is from the pen of Dorothy Sayers. She called it the Cave of Alibaba. Like the tale told by Scheherazade, a distinguished ancestress in the storytelling art, Miss Sayers' thriller deals with 40 thieves and with two magic words. For your uneasy listening, then, suspense presents The Cave of Alibaba. On a Saturday afternoon in January, in a grim and narrow house in Lambeth, a man sat eating kippers and reading the daily paper. He was smallish and spare, with brown hair rather too regularly waved and a strong, brown, pointed beard. His double-breasted navy blue suit, his socks, tie, and handkerchief were all scrupulously matched, and his brown boots just a trifle too highly polished. He did not look a gentleman, not even a gentleman's gentleman. Yet there was something about his appearance which suggested that he was accustomed to the manner of life in good families. A uh, superior butler, perhaps. Yet not old enough to be retired. A footman who had come into a legacy, yes. He had just finished eating, and he was sipping his coffee when a slight noise at the front door caught his ear. Swiftly. Too swiftly for a quiet little man sitting eating kippers and reading his paper on a Saturday afternoon, he sprang up, he dashed through the small hallway, and he flung the door open. Of course, no one in sight. The society is at least dramatic in its delivery of its correspondence. And as if he knew what he would find, he shut the door and turned to the hat stand in the hall. An envelope had been placed there. It was addressed to Joseph Rogers. So, Mr. Rogers opened the note. Number 21. An extraordinary general meeting will be held tonight at the house of number one at 11.30. You, you will be absent at your peril. The word is finality. Hmm. Finality. Yes, I think so. The man called Joseph Rogers stood for a moment, studying the note... Then he strode to the rear of the house to a tall safe built in the wall. Carefully, he manipulated a dial. He swung the safe door open. He stepped inside. 
into a small strong room. He opened a drawer marked correspondence, placed the note inside, and then came out again. A moment to reset the lock for a new combination, and then he went back into the living room. He reached for the telephone, he lifted it from the cradle, and then reconsidered. Too dangerous. He hurried upstairs and clambered into an attic. In the furthest corner, he searched for and found a knothole in the woodwork. He pressed it. A concealed trapdoor swung open, and he was in the loft of the adjoining house. He paused before three cages, in each of them a carrier pigeon. Carefully, he wrote a note, slipped it under a pigeon's wing. There you are, my pretty. There, take it easy now. There. There you go. Fly straight. 4.30. I'll send another pigeon at 5 and the third at 6. I should have my answer by 9.30 at the late... Oh, I forgot one thing most important. Mr. Rogers moved through the trapdoor, back into the attic of his own house, and once again he stood before the tall safe built in the wall. He opened the door, stepped into the strong room, moved for a moment quietly in the dark, and then spoke gently. Now, be good, my sweetheart. I'm depending on you. Open sesame. Come on now, old thing. Open sesame. Open sesame. Ah, That's better. That's very much better. By 9.30, his answer was back. All the little piece of paper said was a hasty okay. At a quarter before 11, he took his revolver from a locked drawer, inspected it carefully. Yes, loaded it with cartridges from an unbroken packet and left the house. He walked quickly, keeping well away from the wall. And when he climbed on a bus, he sat next to the conductor, where he could watch all who got on and off. By 25 minutes after 11, he was out on lonely Hampstead Heath, pausing in the shadow of a large tree to adjust a black velvet mask on which, in white thread, was stitched the number 21. Then he stepped briskly to the door of the villa that lay before him and... What is it? Finality. Come in. Go right on through. Number one will check you in. Right. Twenty-one, sir. Lift your mask. Very well, twenty-one. You may go on to the meeting room. Thank you, sir. The villa in which Mr. Rogers now stood was a large one, a brilliantly lighted room. There was a gramophone in one corner blaring out a jazz tune. To its rhythm, couples, masked men and women, were dancing. Some were in evening dress, some in tweeds and jumpers. In another corner of the room was the bar. Mr. Rogers went up to it and asked the masked man in charge for a double whiskey. He consumed it slowly, leaning on the bar. The room filled. Presently, someone moved across to the gramophone and stopped it. Mr. Rogers looked around. Number one, the massive gentleman in evening dress who had checked him in, appeared on the threshold. A tall woman in black stood beside him. Her mask, embroidered with a white number two, covered her hair and her face completely. Only her, her fine bearing, her white arms, and her dark eyes shining through the eye slits, proclaimed her as a woman of power, of physical attraction. The masked dancers were silent now as number one spoke. Ladies and gentlemen, we are short two members tonight. I need not inform you of the disastrous failure of our plan for obtaining the plans of the court Wendelsham Heliscopa. Our courageous and devoted friends, number 15 and number 38 
We are betrayed and taken by the police. Some of you might fear that under examination these two would break down and give away our society. There is no need for such a fear. I gave the usual orders, and their tongues have been silenced. Their defense will be discreetly compensated in the usual manner. I call upon number 12 and 34 to undertake this agreeable task. They will attend me at my office for their instructions after the meeting. Will the numbers I have named kindly signify by raising their hands that I are able and willing to perform this duty? Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your partners for the next dance. The gramophone struck up again. Mr. Rogers turned to a girl near him in a red dress. She nodded, and they slipped into the movement of a foxtrot. The couples gyrated solemnly and in silence. Their shadows were flung against the blinds as they turned and stepped to and fro. The girl in red spoke to Mr. Rogers. What's happened? I'm frightened, aren't you? I feel as if something awful was about to happen. It does take one a bit short. Number one's way of doing things. But it's safer like that. Oh, those poor men. No oh. talking, please. You know the rules. Sorry. In silence, the dance continued. And then it came to an end. And then when it had finished, the dancers came again to where number one sat and waited with tense eagerness for him to speak. Ladies and gentlemen, you may wonder why this extraordinary meeting has been called. The reason is a serious one. The failure of our recent attempt was no accident. The police were not on the premises that night by accident. We have a traitor amongst us. This last failure was not the first. You'll remember the unfortunate way in which the affair of the Dinglewood Pearls turned out. And there were others. However, I am happy to say that our minds can now be easy. All these troubles have been traced to their origin. The offender has been discovered and will be removed. The misguided member who introduced the traitor to our ranks will be placed in a position where his lack of caution will have no further ill effects. There is no cause for alarm. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your partners for the next dance. Again, the gramophone took up its bizarre monotony. And the masked dancers glided and turned. And their movements were sharper, more staccato. The girl in red was claimed by a tall mask in evening dress. A hand laid on Mr. Rogers' arm made him start. A small, plump woman in a green jumper slipped a cold hand into his. The dance went on. When it stopped, everyone stood detached, stiffened in expectation. The endless interval was over. Number one raised his voice. Ladies and gentlemen, you will no doubt wish to be relieved of the questions on your mind. I will name the persons involved. Number 37. No, no. Silence. I swear on it. Silence. You have failed in discretion. You will be dealt with. If you have anything to say in defense of your folly, I'll hear it later. Sit down. Number 37 sank down upon a chair. He pushed his handkerchief under the mask to wipe his face. Two tall men closed in upon him. The rest fell back. Ladies and gentlemen, I will now name the traitor. Stand forward. Number 21. Take off your mask. Number 37. This man was introduced to our society by you under the name of Joseph Rogers, formerly second footman in the service of the Duke of Denver, dismissed for petty thievery. Did you take steps to verify the statement? I did. I did as God's my witness. It was all straight. I had him identified by two of the servants. I asked all over about him. The story was true. I'll swear it was. Number 21. Your name has been given as Joseph Rogers. Is that your real name? Answer me. Is that your real name? No. What is your name? Peter Death Breden Whimsy. Silence! 
I compliments your lordship. We thought Lord Wimsey was dead. He was killed, so the paper said two winters ago while shooting big game in Africa. He even left a will, proved to 500,000 pounds. To his mother, I believe, the Dowager Duchess of Denver. Lord Peter Wimsey, indeed. Well-known book collector, man about town, distinguished criminologist. Took an active part in the solution of several famous mysteries. Taking an active part, if you don't mind. So you deliberately led us to think you were dead and became Joseph Rogers to gain entrance to our society. Yeah. What has become of the real Joseph Rogers? He died abroad. I, I took his place. And the end of your impersonation to uncover our society. Precisely. I see. The robbery of your own set, upon which we congratulated ourselves, and which you helped to execute, was arranged. Obviously. The robbery of the Duchess, your mother, was arranged by you. It was. It was a very ugly tiara, no real loss to anybody with decent taste. The burglary of the Winthrop Mansion, the theft of the necklace at Covent Garden, the others as well. You arranged them all. All. Uh, may I spoke, by the way? You may not. Numbers 15, 22, 39. You have watched the prisoner. Has he made any attempt to communicate with anybody? Uh, none. His letters and parcels have been opened. His telephone tapped and his movements followed. Even the water pipes in his house have been under observation for Morse code signals. You're certain? Absolutely. Then we may be sure that he has been alone in this adventure. Well, ladies and gentlemen, please take oh, your... Oh, 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 Very well. Take the prisoner away. And be sure you explain carefully to him first the manner of his death. I am sure he'll enjoy it. Wait, wait, at least you can let me die d decently. Take him away. Stop, I have something to say, something to sell. We make no bargains with traitors. No, but listen, do you think I haven't thought of this? I'm not a fool. I've left a letter. To whom? To the police. If I don't return tomorrow, it'll be open. It's a bluff. The prisoner sent no letter. He's been strictly watched for months. I left the letter before I came to Lambeth. Then it can't contain no information of any value. Oh, but it does. The combination of my safe. Indeed? Has this man's safe been searched? Yes. What did it contain? No information of importance, sir. An outline of our organization, the name of the house, nothing that can't be altered and covered before morning. And did you investigate the inner compartment of the safe? You hear what he says, did you? He's trying to bluff. There is no inner compartment. I hate to contradict you, but I'm really afraid you must have overlooked it. And what did you say was in the compartment, if it does exist? The names of every member of this society with their addresses, photographs, and fingerprints. Oh, what? How did you say you have contrived to get this information? By doing a little detective work on my own. But you've been watched. True, the fingerprints of my watch has adorned the first page of the collection. That statement can be proved? Certainly. The name of number 40, for example... Stop! Stop! If you mention names here, you will certainly have no hope of mercy. Bring the prisoner to my office. Ladies and gentlemen, take your partners for the next dance. <laughs> Prove that I know your gang from number one through number 25. Do you want me to prove that I know the others as well? My lord, your story fills me with regret that you are not, in fact, a member of our society. Wit, courage, and industry are valuable in an association like ours. I fear I cannot persuade you. No, I suppose not. Yes? Ask the members kindly to proceed to the supper room. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I will not conceal from you the seriousness of the situation. The prisoner has recited to me 25 names and addresses which we have thought to be unknown except to their owners and to me. There has been great carelessness. Fingerprints have been obtained. He showed me some photographs of them. He tells me that the book of names and addresses is to be found in the inner compartment of his safe together with certain letters and papers stolen from the houses of members and several objects with fingerprints. I believe he tells the truth. He offers the combination of the safe in exchange for a quick death. I think his offer should be accepted. What is your opinion, ladies and gentlemen? The combination is known already. Fool! This man is Lord Peter Wimsey, a scientist of crime. Do you think he will have forgotten to change the combination? Oh, I say give him the promise. Time's getting short. Yeah, 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 yeah. You agreed? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a bargain, Wednesday. What is the combination? The word of the combination is unreliability. 
And the inner door, the inner compartment. In anticipation of the visit of the police, the inner door is open. Good. Number 12 and 36. You'll go to the prisoner's house and... Why should any more members... That's right. Uh, I agree. Nobody ought to be trusted. Then what, ladies and gentlemen, do you suggest? You go yourself. You're the only one that knows all the names. You go yourself. I second that motion. Is the wish of the meeting then that I should go? No. I say no. No, don't go. Number one is our president, the head and soul of our society. If anything should happen to him, where should we be? You've all blundered. We have your carelessness to thank for all this. Do you think we should be safe for five minutes if he were not here to repair your folly? Well, there's something in that. If you will pardon my suggesting it, the lady appears to be in a position peculiarly favorable for the reception of the president's confidences. The contents of my modest volume will be no news to her. Why should she not go herself? Because I say she must not. If it is the will of the meeting, I'll go. Give me the key of the house. Here. Is your house watched? No. If I have not returned in two hours, act for the best to save yourselves. And do what you like with the prisoner. The president has been gone two hours. Traitor! What's happened to him? How should I know? Perhaps he's uh, looked after himself and gone while the going was good. Liar! He'd never do that. What have you done with him? Speak, or I'll make you speak. I can can only form a guess, madam. I'm afraid that your president may quite inadvertently have left the door of the inner compartment closed behind him, in which case... Yes. Well, let me explain the mechanism of my safe. hmm? The inner compartment has two doors. The outermost most opens outward with an ordinary key. Oh, do you think that the president is so stupid as to be caught in an obvious trap? Undoubtedly, he will have wedged open that inner door. Undoubtedly, madam. But the sole purpose of that inner door is to appear to be the only one. Hidden behind the hinge of that door is another, a sliding panel, also left open. Inside the compartment is the big, heavy ledger containing all the information about this society. This ledger lies on a steel shelf. Uh, Do I make myself clear? Yes, 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 go on. The steel shelf is balanced on a concealed spring. When the weight of the book, the ledger, is lifted... The shelf rises almost imperceptibly, and in rising, it makes an electrical contact. Now, let me draw a picture. Your president steps into the inner compartment, sees the book, takes it up anxiously to examine to see if it's the right one. The shelf rises, the electrical contact is made, and the steel panel behind him slides into place. He's trapped. You devil! What is the word that opens the inner door? Quick! The word. Do you remember the story of Ali Baba and the Forty Thieves? Uh-huh. Well, when, when I had this safe constructed, my mind went back, well, call me sentimental if you will, to my childhood. The words that open the door are open sesame. Oh. How long can a man live in this devil's trap of yours? Oh, I should think he might hold out for a few hours if he didn't use up all the oxygen by you know, hammering and yelling. I imagine if we go there at once, we'd be able to get him out all right. I'll go myself. I think you'd better take me with you. Why? Well, I'm the only person who can open the door. But you've given me the word. Yes, you have the word. But this door of mine, (laughs) I'm rather proud of it. You know, it's my own invention. It's the latest thing. It will open to the words, open sesame, all right. But to my voice only. Your voice. I chop your voice in my hands. What do you mean, your voice only? Don't clutch my throat like that. You'll wreck my voice and then the door might not recognize it. Ah, there, that's better. The door got stuck for a week once and when I had a cold. Is what he says true? Is it possible? Perfectly possible, madam. It will have a microphone arrangement. It could be done also with light vibrations. We must let him go. Take the ropes off him. Let him go? Nothing. He doesn't go to blab to the police. The president's done in, that's all. And we'd all better make traps while we can. It's all up, boys. Right. Chuck this fellow down the cellar and fasten him in. I'll go and destroy the ledgers. 32, you know where the switch is. Give us a quarter of an hour to clear, then you can blow the place to glory. No. No, you can't leave one to die. He's your president, your leader. I won't let it happen. I won't. I'll free this man myself. Here, yeah, none of that. No. Let me go. Let go of me. Think, let not me just go. think. It'll be light in an hour or two. The police may be here at any moment. Police? Oh, yes. Yes, you're right. No, we mustn't imperil the safety of all for just one man. He himself would not wish it. 
throw this man in the cellar and let's get out of here while I sign. <laughs> Here. Uh, this is good enough. Leave him here. Right. Uh, now, uh, let's go. Hey, you chaps. Yeah, I'm sure they can't get me. I say, it's lonesome down here in this cellar. You might at least leave the light on. Don't worry about the dark. That thinking you here is the time juice for the bomb that's going to blow out this place. It's all set. You won't have long to wait. Uh, not <laughs> long. <laughs> Who is it? Who's there? Shh. Hold still. So I can cut the ropes. Well, if it isn't too. My compliments, madam, on your loyalty to the president. Quick, quick. They've set the time fuse. The house is mine. Follow me as fast as you can. Number one must be saved. And only you can do it. Well, how did you manage to? Oh, yeah, there's no time for questions. Get up and follow me. You will release him. You promise. I promise. But I warn you, madam, that this house is surrounded. When my safe uh, door closed, it gave a signal to Scotland Yard. All the members of the society had taken. Oh, never mind them. Here, outside. Quick. Is that you, Inspector? Get your fellows away. Quick. The house is going up in a minute. I'm a bit winded. What happened, Inspector? Oh, about half a dozen of them got blown up. The rest we bagged. Uh, hurry, we must hurry. Who's this? Oh, one of the gang. She's called number two. We must save him. We must. Golly, I clean forgot the gentleman in the safe. Uh, Walker, where's your car? It's down the lane. Then uh, one of your men down to get it. Right. Uh, Johnson, bring that car here. Yes, sir. I've got the, the number one of the whole company quietly asphyxiating at home. I promised we'd get back and save him. Oh, he's the bloke that we've been wanting. The man at the back of the Morrison case and the Hope Wilmington case and hundreds of others. Is this it? Hmm. Quite a contraption. Yes, I only hope he hasn't upset the adjustment by something like it. Oh, please, Ollie. I hope you haven't heard my voice. Oh, you sound all right. I can only be conversational. Come on, old thing. Show us your faces. Open sesame. Open sesame. Confound you. Open sesame. Open sesame. Let me see. No, he's not. He lived to stand his trial. right with the world, as it always is when Lord Peter Whimsey is involved. The Cave of Alibaba by Dorothy Sayers is the story which gave us tonight's suspense. Suspense is produced by William Spear. Our guest director for this evening was Robert Louis Sheehan. Tonight's radio drama was written by Peter Lyon and scored by Bernard Herman. Romney Brent was Peter Whimsey, William Moulton played number one, and Ira Gerald, the lady in the case. Others in the cast were Kathleen Cordell, Victor Beecroft, Roland Bottomley, J.W. Austin, William Podmore, Ian Martin, and William Malton. Next Wednesday, suspense will not be heard because of a special all-star Hollywood broadcast which Paramount Pictures will present. Two weeks from tonight, at this time, Columbia will bring you another selected story from the world's great literature of thrills. Another study in... Suspense.
This is Barry Kroger, and this is the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Columbia Network takes pleasure in bringing you Suspense. Columbia's parade of outstanding thrillers, produced and directed by William Spear, and scored by Bernard Herrmann. The notable melodramas from stage and screen, fiction and radio, presented each week to bring you to the edge of your chair, to keep you in suspense. Good evening. This is Orson Welles. Very happy I am to be back in the United States and back on the Columbia Network, even for so short a visit as this one. Back with old friends like Johnny Dietz, who's tonight's director, and Bernard Herman. The Mercury Theater presented tonight's radio play for the first time last year. We came right out then and hailed it as a classic of the medium. Nobody argued the point. A lot of people asked us to do it again, so it's gratifying to get the chance now and to find a favorite of ours in this distinguished anthology of spook shows. Personally, I've never met anybody who didn't like a good ghost story. But I know a lot of people who think there are a lot of people who don't like a good ghost story. For the benefit of these, at least, I go on record at the outset of this evening's entertainment with a sober assurance that although blood may be curdled on this program, none will be spilt. There's no shooting, knifing, throttling, axing, or poisoning here. No clanking chains, no cobwebs, no bony and or hairy hands appearing from secret panels or, better yet, bedroom curtains. If it's any part of that dear old phosphorescent foolishness that people who don't like ghost stories don't like, then again, I promise you, we haven't got it. Not tonight. What we do have is a thriller. It's half as good as we think it is. You can call it a shocker. It's already been called a real Orson Welles story. Now, frankly, I don't know what this means. I've been on the air directing and acting in my own shows for quite a while now, and I don't suppose I've done more than half a dozen thrillers in all that time. Honestly, I don't think even that many, but it seems I do have a reputation for the uncanny. Quite possibly, a little escapade of mine involving a couple of planets, which shall be nameless, is responsible. Doesn't really matter. Don't think I disapprove of thrillers. I don't. A story doesn't have to appeal to the heart. It can also appeal to the spine. Sometimes you want your heart to be warmed. And sometimes you want your spine to tingle. The tingling, it's to be hoped, will be quite audible as you listen tonight to The Hitchhiker. That's the name of our story. The Hitchhiker. <laughs> Route 66, just west of Gallup, New Mexico. If I tell it, perhaps it'll help me. Keep me from going, going crazy. I gotta tell this quickly. I'm not crazy now. I feel perfectly well, except that I'm running a slight temperature. My name is Ronald Adams. I'm 36 years of age. Unmarried, tall, dark, with a black mustache. I drive a 1940 Buick license number 6Y175189. I was born in Brooklyn. All this I know. I know that I'm at this moment perfectly sane. But it's not me who's gone a fan. It's something else. Something utterly beyond my control. I want to speak quickly. At any minute, the link may break. This may be the last thing I ever tell on Earth. The last night I ever see the stars. 6 days ago I left Brooklyn to drive to California. Goodbye, son. Good luck to you, my boy. Goodbye, mother. Here, give me a kiss. Can I go? I'll come out with you to the car. Oh no, it's raining. Stay at the door. Oh. <laughs> What's this? Tears? I thought you promised me you wouldn't cry. Oh, I know, dear. I'm sorry. But I 
I do hate to see you. I'll be back. It'll only be on the coast three months. Oh, it isn't that. It's, it's just the trip. Ronald, I wish you weren't drowning. Oh, Mother, there you go again. People do it every day. I know, but you'll be careful, won't you? Promise me you'll be extra careful. Don't fall asleep or drive fast or pick up any strangers on the road. Oh, gosh. I think I was still 17 here, you two. Oh, and why? I mean, as soon as you get to Hollywood, of won't you, son? Of course I will. Don't you worry. There's nothing going to happen. It's just eight days of perfectly simple driving on smooth, decent, civilized roads. With a hot dog or a hamburger stand every day. I was in fine spirits. The drive ahead of me, even the loneliness, seemed like a lark. I reckoned without him. Crossing Brooklyn Bridge that morning in the rain, I saw a man leaning against the cables. He seemed to be waiting for a lift. There were spots of fresh rain on his shoulders. He was carrying a cheap overnight bag in one hand. He was thin, nondescript, with a cap fall down over his eyes. I would have forgotten him completely, except that just an hour later, while crossing the Pulaski Skyway over the Jersey Flats, I saw him again. At least, he looked like the same person. He was standing now with one thumb pointing west. I couldn't figure out how he got there, but I thought probably one of those fast trucks had picked him up, beat me to the Skyway, and let him off. I didn't stop for him. And late that night, I saw him again. It's on the new Pennsylvania turnpike between Harrisburg and Pittsburgh. It's 265 miles long with a very high speed limit. I was just slowing down for one of the tunnels. When I saw him, standing under an arc light by the side of the road, I seen quite distinctly the bag, the cap, even the spots of fresh rain. Over his shoulders. He... Hello, Hello. Hello. Stepped on the gas like a shot. That's lonely country to the Alleghenies, and I had no intention of stopping. Besides the coincidences, or whatever it was, maybe the Willies. Stopped at the next gas station. Fill her up. Certainly, sir. Check your oil, sir? No, thanks. Nice night, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> it hasn't been raining here recently, has it? Not a drop of rain all the way. Oh? Oh, I, I suppose that doesn't done your business any harm. Oh, people drive through here all kinds of weather. Mostly business, you know. There aren't many pleasure cars out on the turnpike this season of the year. I suppose not. What, uh, uh, uh what about hitchhikers? Hitchhikers here? What's the matter? Don't you ever see any? Not much. If we did, it'd be a sight for sore eyes. Why? Oh, a guy'd be a fool who started out to hitch rides on this road. Look at it. Then, you've never seen anybody? No. Maybe they get the lift before the turnpike starts. I mean, you know, just before the toll house. But then it'd be a mighty long ride. Most cars wouldn't want to pick up a guy for that long a ride. And you know, this is pretty lonesome country here. Mountains and woods. You ain't seen anybody like that, have you? Uh, no. Oh, no, not, not at all. I just... Uh, a technical question. <laughs> see. Well, that'll be just a dollar forty-nine with the tax. <laughs> Gradually passed through my mind a sheer coincidence. I had a good night's sleep in Pittsburgh. I didn't think about the man all next day until... Well, just outside of Zanesville, Ohio, I saw him again. It's a bright, sunshiny afternoon in the peaceful Ohio fields. Brown with the autumn stubble lay greening in the golden light. I was driving slowly, drinking it in. And the road suddenly ended in a detour in front of the barrier. He was standing. Let me explain about his appearance before I go on. 
I repeat, there was nothing sinister about him. He was as drab as a mud fence. There was his attitude menacing. He merely stood there, waiting, almost drooping a little, with a cheap overnight bag in his hand. He looked as though he'd been waiting there for hours. And he looked up. He hailed me. He started to walk forward. Hello! 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 No, uh, not just now, sorry. Hello to California? No, not today. The other way, going to New York, sorry. I had the thought of <clears throat> picking him up, of having him sit beside me. It was somehow unbearable. At the same time, I felt more than ever unspeakably alone. Hour after hour went by. Fields, the towns ticked off one by one. The light changed. I knew now that I was going to see him again. And though I dreaded the sight, I caught myself searching the side of the road, waiting for him to appear. Sell sandwiches and pop here, don't you? Yeah, we go. The daytime. We're closed up now for the I know, but I was wondering if you could possibly have a cup of coffee, black coffee. Just No, not this time of night, mister. My wife's a cook. She's a man. Uh, uh, don't shut the door, please. Listen, just a minute ago. Uh, just a minute ago, there was a man standing here right beside the stand, a suspicious looking man. I, I don't mean to disturb it. And you see, I was driving along when I just happened to look, and there he was. How was he doing? For nothing. You've been taking a nip. That's what you've been doing. Now, run your way before I call out your boats. I got into the car again and drove on slowly. It's getting to hate the car. If I could have found a place to stop, to rest a little. I was in the Ozark Mountains of Missouri now. Few resort places that were closed, only an occasional log cabin, seemingly deserted. That's all that broke the monotony of the wild, wooded landscape. I had seen him at that roadside stand. I knew I'd see him again. Maybe at the next turn of the road. I knew that when I saw him next, I would run him down. I didn't see him again. I didn't see him at all. Late next afternoon. I stopped a car at a sleepy little junction just across the border into Oklahoma to let a train pass by. When he appeared across the tracks, leaning against a telephone pole. Perfectly airless, dry day. The red clay of Oklahoma was baking under the southwestern sun. Yet there were spots of fresh rain on his shoulders. I couldn't stand that. Without thinking, blindly, I started the car across the tracks. He didn't look up at me. He was staring at the ground. I stepped on the gas. I turned the wheel sharply toward him. I could hear the train in the distance now, but I didn't care. I went along with the car. The train was coming closer. I could hear the bell ringing and the cry was whistling. Still, he stood there. And now I knew that he was beckoning, beckoning me to my death. Yeah. I frustrated him that time. I started work at last. I managed to back up. And the train passed. He was gone. I was all alone in the hot, dry afternoon. After that, I knew I had to do something. I didn't know who this man was or what he wanted of me. I only knew that from now on, 
I mustn't let myself alone on the road for one minute. Uh, hello there. Like a ride? Well, what do you think? How far are you going? Uh, where do you want to go? Amarillo, Texas. I'll drive you there. Gee. <laughs> Uh, do you mind if I take off my shoes? My dogs are killing me. Go right ahead. Oh, gee, what a break. Have you tried much? Sure. Only it's tough sometimes in these great open spaces to get the break. Uh, I should think it would be, though. I'll bet you get a good pickup in a fast car. If you did, you could get places faster than, say, another person in another car, couldn't you? I don't get you. Well, take me, for instance. Suppose I'm I'm driving across the country, say, at a nice steady clip about 45 miles an hour. <clears throat> couldn't couldn't a girl like you just standing beside the road waiting for a list beat me to town? Or any town, provided she got picked up every time in a car doing from 65 to 70 miles an hour? I don't know. What difference does it make? Oh, no difference. It's just a crazy idea I had sitting here in the car. Oh, imagine spending your time in a swell car thinking of things like that. What would you do instead? What would I do? If I was a good-looking fellow like yourself? Why, I just enjoy myself every minute of the time. I'd sit back and, and relax. I never saw a good-looking girl along the side of the road. Hey, look out! Did you see this See who? A man standing inside the barbed wire fence. Oh, I didn't see anybody. I... It wasn't nothing but a bunch of cows and, and a wire fence. No? What did you think you was doing? Trying to run into the barbed wire fence? man there, I tell you. A thin gray man with an overnight bag in his hand. And I, I was trying to run him down. Run him down? Kill him? Say so you didn't see him back there? You sure? I didn't see a soul. As far watch as I can for him the next time. And keep watching. Your eyes peeled on the road. You'll turn up again. And you know. There, look there. Ah! How does this door work? I, I'm getting out of here. Did you see him that time? No, I didn't see him that time. And personally, mister, I don't expect never to see him. All I want to do is go on living. I don't see how I will very long, driving with you. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't... I... I don't know what came over me. Please don't go. So if you'll excuse me. You can't go. Listen, how would you like to go to California? I'll drive you to California. Seeing pink elephants all the way? No, thanks. Uh-uh. Thanks just the same. Listen, please. Just, just one minute, please. You know what I think you need, big boy? Not a girlfriend. Just a good dose of sleep. Please. There. I got it now. Now you can't go. Please. Keep your hands off me. Do you hear? Keep your hands off me. She ran from me. As though I were a monster. Two minutes later, I saw a passing truck pick her up. I knew then that I was utterly alone. It was in the heart of the great Texas prairies. There wasn't a car on the road after the truck went by. I tried to figure out what to do, how to get hold of myself. If I could find a place to rest, or even if I could sleep right here in the car for a few hours along the side of the road. Getting my winter overcoat out of the back seat to use as a blanket when I saw him coming toward me, emerging from the herd of moving steer. Hello! Maybe I should have spoken to him then. Thought it out then and there. For now, he began to be everywhere. Whenever I stopped, even for a moment, for gas, for oil, for a drink of pop, a cup of coffee, sandwich, he was there. I saw him standing outside the auto camp in Amarillo that night when I dared to slow down. He was sitting near the drinking fountain, a little camping spot, just inside the border of New Mexico. He was waiting for me outside the Navajo Reservation where I stopped to check my tires. I saw him in Albuquerque when I bought 20 gallons of gas. I was... I was afraid to stop. I began to drive faster and faster. I was... in, in lunar landscape now. The great arid Mesa country of New Mexico. 
I drove through it with the indifference of a fly crawling over the face of the moon. Now he didn't even wait for me to stop. Unless I drove at 85 miles an hour over those endless roads, he waited for me at every other mile. I'd see his figure, shadowless, flitting before me, still in the same attitude, over the cold, lifeless ground, flitting over dried-up rivers, over broken stones cast up by old glacial upheavals, flitting in that pure and cloudless air. I was beside myself when I finally reached Gallup, New Mexico this morning. There's an auto camp here. Cold, almost deserted this time of year. I went inside and asked if there was a telephone. I had the feeling that if only I could speak to someone familiar, someone I loved, I could pull myself together. Your call, please. Long distance. Long distance, certainly. This is long distance. I'd like to, uh, I'd like to put a, in a call to my home in Brooklyn, New York. I'm Ronald Adams. I'm, uh, the, the number is Beachwood 200828. Certainly. I will try to get it for you. Albuquerque. New York for Gallup. New York. Gallup, New Mexico, calling Beachwood 20828. I read somewhere that love could banish demons. It's the middle of the morning. I knew Mother would be home. I pictured her tall and white-haired in her crisp house dress, going about her tasks. Be enough, I thought, just to hear the even calmness of her voice. Will you please deposit $3.85 for the first three minutes? When you have deposited a dollar and a half, will you wait until I have collected the money? All right, deposit another dollar and a half. Will you please deposit the remaining 85 cents? Ready with Brooklyn. Go ahead, please. Hello? Hello? Mrs. Adams' residence. Hello. Hello, Mother. This is Mrs. Adams' residence. Who is it you wish to speak to, please? What? Oh, who is this? This is Mrs. Winnie. Mrs. Winnie? I, I don't know any Mrs. Winnie. Is this Beachwood 208828? Yes. Uh, oh, where, where's my mother? Where's Mrs. Adams? Mrs. Adams is not at home. She's still in the hospital. The hospital? Yes. Who's this calling, please? Is it a member of the family? Well, what's she in the hospital for? She's been prostrated for five days. Nervous breakdown. But who is Nervous calling? breakdown? Well, my grandmother never was nervous. It's all taken place since the death of her oldest son, Ronald. Death of her... Death of her oldest son, Ronald? Hey, what's this? What number is this? This is Beechwood 20828. It's all been very sudden. He was killed just six days ago in an automobile accident on the Brooklyn Bridge. Your three minutes are up, sir. Your three minutes are up, sir. Your three minutes are up, sir. And so... So I'm sitting here in this deserted auto camp in Gallup, New Mexico. I'm trying to think. I'm trying to get hold of myself. Otherwise, I am going to go crazy. Outside, it's night. 
the vast, soulless night of New Mexico. A million stars are in the sky. Ahead of me stretch a thousand miles of empty mesa. Mountains. Prairies. Desert. Somewhere among them, he's waiting for me. Somewhere I shall know who he is and who I am. So ends The Hitchhiker. And to Orson Welles, our considerable thanks for his playing of the title role. Mr. Welles, help wanted. Men, women, and children. Nature of work, hard, monotonous, back-breaking labor. Hours, 75 a week minimum. Pay, a few cents an hour. Added inducement. Two meals a day, including several ounces of bad bread and a cup of thin soup. Don't delay. Apply at once. How'd you respond to a want ad like that, Mr. and Mrs. American working man and woman? You'd laugh, wouldn't you, and throw the paper in the trash basket. Dismiss the whole advertisement as some kind of a joke, but believe me, it's no joke. It's a simple statement of the working conditions that exist today in Nazi Germany and the conquered countries under Nazi rule. It's also an exact statement of the working conditions that will be imposed on you and every member of your family if the Nazis win this war. You yourself personally can stop them from winning, as you know. You don't have to give up your well-paid job to do it. You needn't have to be a soldier or a sailor or an airman or a nurse or a war worker to ensure American victory. Uncle Sam doesn't ask plain, ordinary, hard-working citizens like you to give him anything. All he asks, all this he does ask very seriously and very urgently, is that you loan him ten cents out of every dollar you make. That's all there is to it. Lend Uncle Sam a dime to win this war. And he'll pay you back with interest when he's won it. The easiest, most convenient way to lend him these dimes is to enroll in the payroll savings plan. Just tell your boss to deduct ten cents from every dollar he pays you and lend it to Uncle Sam in your name. Sign up for this simple savings plan today, and when victory comes, you'll have war bonds in your pockets instead of Axis bonds on your wrists. Suspense will be heard again two weeks from tonight. Next Wednesday night, September 9th, the Columbia Broadcasting System will present over many of these stations at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Wartime an address by W. Averill Harriman, the United States Land Lease Administrator in London. Mr. Harriman, as the personal representative of the President of the United States, attended the Moscow conferences between Winston Churchill and Joseph Stalin. Next Wednesday's broadcast will be Mr. Harriman's first public address since his return to this country. Suspense is produced and directed by William Spear. John Dietz was our guest director this evening. Tonight's radio drama was written by Lucille Fletcher. The original score was by Bernard Herman. give a few seconds of your time to help win this war? Then listen. At Stalingrad the other day, a Nazi tank unit attacked a corps of Russian soldiers. The Russians tried to stop the tanks and fought until their guns were silenced. Then did they surrender? Did they retreat? No. Eighteen of them rushed forward with bombs in their hands, got under the tanks and blew them up. They gave their lives for their country. You and I are not asked to give our lives for ours. All we're asked to do is buy war bonds and stamps. Our American soldiers are giving their lives for us each day. More and more of them every day. Can we do less than loan our money to them? It's such a simple, easy thing to do. Out of every dollar you earn, lend one dime to your country. Do it regularly by joining the 10% club where you work. And do it now. Our soldiers need your help. Columbia Network takes pleasure in bringing you Suspense.
suspense. Parade of Outstanding Thrillers, produced by William Spear and scored by Bernard Herrmann. The notable melodramas from stage and screen, fiction and radio, presented each week to bring you to the edge of your chair, to keep you in suspense. Tonight's story deals with a remote and dangerous house and the terrifying thing that happened there because the rain went on for days and days. It deals with a surgeon and a girl, a giant, and a young man who took a long chance. And over them all, the moan of the night wind and the ceaseless roar of the storm. For your suspenseful listening, we invite you to learn about Four days of rain had been ceaseless, teeming, pouring with a steady, relentless rhythm. Four solid days. The fields around Culston had been turned into huge puddles that reflected the heavy, swollen sky. And Dr. Morrissey was stirred by a deep anxiety. He stood beside a window in his sanitarium, which rose high on a lonely hill, a few miles from the little town of Culston, and stared into the jagged, spraying screen of rain. It was just three o'clock. Three o'clock of an afternoon he would long remember. He was on the point of sending for Caffrey, the ward attendant, when the door opened, and Caffrey came in, pale, disturbed. Dr. Morrissey. Is there anything wrong, Caffrey? I don't know. There's a feeling down in the ward. Feeling? This rain's going on too long. The patient's getting uneasy. They're bound to, ain't they? If a guy with good nerves, he gets jumpy. You can imagine what it does to theirs. Seem to be affecting anyone in particular. Number five has been carrying on. Hitler? Yeah. I brought him up. Nurse Carter's waiting with him out in the hall. That is that? He's upsetting the others. He's asking for some guy named Benham. Oh, that's the man he killed. I didn't know he was homicidal. Oh, it was an accident. He was performing a brain surgery on Benham and... Uh, him? Oh, Kettler was a very important surgeon, Capri. Didn't you know that? He keeps saying so, but... It's, it's perfectly true. Very successful, Dr. Kettler was. Until he perfected an operative procedure that he called the Kettler Method. A new process of brain operation. Spent most of his life on it and... Well, when he tried it for the first time on this young lad, Benham, and Benham died on the table... It, it unbalanced his mind. I've got to go back down there now. I think you'd better wait while I talk with Kitler. Okay, I'll bring him in. But don't make it long. I don't like the feel of things around here. Nurse! Miss Carter! Yes, we're coming. You can bring him in now. Come along. Dr. Morris, he wants to see you. Does he now? Does he? Come in, Kitler. I'd like to ask Dr. Morris a question. I'd like to ask him a question. Yes, Dr. Kitler. I should like to ask him where Laird Benham is. I know he'll never tell me. But I will, Kettler. Laird Benham is buried somewhere out there under the rain. He is at peace, Kettler. Can't you forget about him? Just forget. You'd all like me to forget about him, wouldn't you? Then you could keep him hidden away forever, couldn't you? Benham is dead, Kettler. You know that. Benham died. He did not. He's alive. He was alive when you and the rest of the envious medical profession stole him from the operating table. Kidnapped him with my bandages still around his head. You were determined to make the Kettler method seem a failure, weren't you? Weren't you? Easy, easy now. Believe me, Kettler. I let I Benham know where die. he is now, Dr. Morrissey. He's in the cellar under the war downstairs, isn't he? Isn't he? Kettler. <laughs> let me see him. Fair Benham. Oh, you'd better take him down, Kettler. All right. Come along now, sir. I'll take him this. You won't show him to me. 
Even though it would make me well again. My cell is a empty Kettler. Believe me, Benham isn't there. You sit there in power and order me away. Come on, Kettler. There's something I have to say. I've always been above violence, Dr. Morrissey. But the time comes when there's no other course. This is a warning, Doctor. A warning. And the joke is that you won't heed it. A man with you. You won't heed it now. But you'll remember it. And soon you'll remember it. Tables turn, Dr. Morrissey. Tables turn. <laughs> Poor thing. Uh, I'm afraid I'm failing with him. Failing completely. But you're not. It takes time to put a man back together. Oh, it's taking me too long with Ketcher. I'm beginning to be afraid. If you'll pardon me, Doctor. Yes? I do think you're making a mistake. With him? No, with yourself. You haven't had a real vacation in three years, Dr. Marcy. Oh, you think I'm wearing a bit thin just now, don't you? And you're right. But I really can't leave my patients in anyone else's hands. Not now, at any rate. No, I'll have to make the best of it. But you need relaxation. I know, I know. Well, I hope to soothe my ragged nerves somewhat over this weekend. Oh? I have some friends coming down from the city Friday night. Leslie and Claire Winton. Young married couple, newlyweds. And I'm just going to relax with them and forget everything until Monday morning. You must, Doctor. You do need it so badly. Oh, by the way, Doctor. Yes? I slipped some of uh, those new sample bandages into your coat pocket. Well, thanks, thanks. I'll have a look at them. I think they're quite good. The salesman said that... Yes, nurse. What is it? Did, did you hear something? Thunder, wasn't it? Something else besides thunder. I thought it. Well, I didn't hear it. <laughs> My nerves must be getting the best of me. Perhaps it's a case of nurse heal thyself, eh? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the only one who needs a rest. You know, it might be a very good idea if we both... <laughs> Dr. Morrissey. I heard that. What is it? It's coming from the wards. Sounds like... That was a shot, nurse. You get on the phone. Call the police. The coast. Hello? Hello? Hello. Keep at it, keep at it. Hello? Someone's trying to get in from the hall. Stop the mercy! Stop the mercy! Catfrey, just a moment. Catfrey! Catfrey, what is it? Stand up with me! All of them are coming up the stairs! Get them! Get out of here! Oh! oh. Steady, nurse. He's dead, isn't he? Isn't he? Yes. Doctor Morrissey, Hitler. Remember my warning. Remember it, Doctor. Tables turn, Doctor Morrissey. Tables turn. <laughs> Three more days. Friday night came, black, wet, and glistening. The 815 Express roamed into Colston Station, bringing Leslie and Claire Wenton out from the city with their weekend luggage. Isn't Dr. Morrissey sending his car for us, Leslie? Yes, Claire. The chauffeur was supposed to drive us over to the sanitarium to pick up the dock, and then we're all going over to his house together. Well, I don't see any car, do you? I don't see anything but water. Maybe we're rolling over and skip. <laughs> oh. Oh, I hate that sound. Like somebody's in agony. I think you're a little depressed, dear. Well, I shouldn't be surprised. My head's still aching dreadfully. Poor lover. How long has that been going on now? Almost a week. It, it frightens me. I don't think it's anything serious. Waiting in the rain like this doesn't do it any good, I'm sure. I don't understand. Doc's usually so punctual. Right on the dot. You don't suppose we ought to call the sanitarium? You people or Dr. Morrissey? Yes. Well, uh, yes, yes, we're the Wintons. Doc sent you to pick us up? I, Cato, Dr. Morrissey's chauffeur. You got luggage? Um, yes. Here it is. I take. You follow me to car. Um. Uh, we're coming. Leslie? Yes? He's, he's tremendous, isn't he? He 
must be six and a half feet tall. I'm over six myself, darling. He's nearer eight. That's a giant. Get those shoulders. He could snap me in two like a matchstick. Oh, I... I hope he likes us. So do I, light of my life. Ah, waiting. You come, please. But I really don't think he does. Mm -hmm. Coming. The car lurched and hurtled over the rain-soaked road, tearing wildly through the dark and careening up the hillside toward the stark walls of the sanitarium. It skidded to a standstill in front of the main entrance, and cold, black Cato led them inside. The brightly lit corridors were deserted, silent, like always in a nightmare. Claire was aware of her headache growing steadily worse as Cato opened the double doors and ushered them into the waiting room. You'll tell Dr. Morrissey we're here, huh? Doctor, be with you soon. You do not go away. Yes, uh, thanks. I hope we're not staying in here very long. It isn't very cheery, is it? Oh, I don't like places like this. I suppose it's very foolish of me, but... But I always feel as if I'm in some sort of danger. That's the headache again. Everything seems worse than it really is when you're not feeling well. Don't you always find... Hardly. Yes? Listen. What is it? Somebody's knocking. Just a moment. Gracias, adios. Who is it, Leslie? I... I don't know. What? You do not know me. I am Arturo Alvarez, a South American pianist. You have heard of me? Well, sure, I've heard of Arturo Alvarez, but I'd hardly expect to find him in... Leslie, humor him. Oh, of course, for a moment I forgot where I was. I've uh, heard of you, Mr. Alvarez. Is there anything I can do for you? Will you help me? I must get out of this place. Oh, sure. I came here several days ago to be treated for a mild nervous trouble. And now, now they won't let me go. I am being held a prisoner. And tonight I am scheduled to give a concert at Carnegie Hall, and I must get out of here. Please, will you help me? Ah, number ten out of the ward again, I see. How many times must I tell you that is strictly against the rules? I was doing nothing wrong. I was only telling this gentleman that I must be at Carnegie Hall for my concert. Yes, yes, yes. I'm sure the gentleman was very interested. Hey, Cato. Yes, uh, Doctor. Cato, you will escort number ten back to the ward and see to it that he doesn't wander back into the waiting room. No, no, I will not be taken back to the ward. Help me. Oh, no. Help me. No. 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 I will no. No. Uh, how strongly he believes in his delusion. Strange fantasy of a diseased mind. Seriously believes that he's Arturo Alvarez. He was telling me. Oh, I'm, I'm very sorry. I'm afraid I haven't been very cordial. Uh, won't you sit down? Is there anything I can do for you? Well, you see, Dr. Morrissey invited us up for the weekend. Oh, yes, of course. He told me he was expecting you. Does he know we're here? I'm afraid not. Uh, Dr. Morrissey was unexpectedly called away on an emergency case, and I'm in charge of the sanitarium until he returns. Well, do you have any idea about when that'll be? Well, it's very hard to say. However, he asked me to ask you to wait and see to it that you're made comfortable. And uh, you see now, your name is... Winton. Uh, Leslie Winton. And uh, this is my wife, Claire. Ah, yes. Uh, maybe to introduce myself. I'm Dr. Kettler. Dr. Morrissey's assistant. Uh, what can I do for you? A bite of food or a drink, perhaps? I don't think so. There's nothing in the world I want so much as an aspirin. Aspirin? Yes, doctor. She's had a headache that's been troubling her for days. It's terribly annoying. I can well imagine. Annoying and interesting. That is to a man of my profession, of course, but... If you step into the inner office, I think I can offer you something a good deal more effective. Oh, I hate to trouble you. No trouble at all. I find these things most intriguing. Should I, Leslie? I think you might as well. Morrissey won't be back for a long time by the looks of things. Yes, you're quite right, Mr. Winton. Dr. Morrissey won't be back for a long, long time. Oh, well, then, uh, oh, which way do I go? Right this way. The large door on your left. You won't mind waiting alone, will you, darling? Oh, Mr. Winton shall make himself comfortable. There are cigarettes in the box, whiskey in the liquor cabinet, and the radio behind the ferns there. I'm sure he'll be quite happy. Uh, after you, Mrs. Winton. If Dr. Morrissey comes in, let me know. I hope you'll find everything you want, sir. Thanks. Uh, by the way, Doctor. Yes? You said you had something better than aspirin. I didn't know there was anything better than aspirin for a headache. 
I have something, Mr. Linton. Really? It's a process which I invented myself. One that never fails. A little treatment, very effective and highly complicated, called the Kettler Method. Please make yourself at home, Mr. Linton. Leslie sat there, alone in the big waiting room for a while. Then creeps began setting in, and he thought to himself, Maybe I'll have that drink after all. He rose and went over to the liquor cabinet that Kepler had pointed out to him, and opened it. Why, well, there's nothing in here but books. Yes, books. Books that were so thick with dust that it was clear they'd been there for months. Hmm. No drink for Leslie. Maybe a cigarette. Kettler said the box was full. He picked it up and started opening it. Why, it isn't even a cigarette box. The darn thing's a bookend. Yes, that's just what it was. Leslie began to think it was a tough job making himself at home in that waiting room. And then the idea occurred to him. Maybe the radio works. He went over to the radio then, turned it on, and... We are sorry to announce that the program scheduled for this time from Carnegie Hall has been cancelled due to the mysterious disappearance of Arturo Alvarez, the noted South American pianist. Mr. Alvarez was known to be suffering from a minor nervous disorder and was last seen departing on a short trip to Colston in upstate New York. Alvarez? That guy is Alvarez. What's going on here? There! There! What? Dr. Kidder, open this door! Open it! Do you hear me? You! Tell him to open up! Tell him! Tell him! Doctor, send me. Tell you, young lady, headache bad. Very bad. What do you mean? He operates. Operate? He say take long time. He say you not wait. You come back tomorrow. Operate? No, no! Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Of course she can hear you, Mr. Winton. The operating table is just inside the door. Bring her out here. Let her go, I tell you, Kettler. But I find that an operation is indicated, Mr. Winton. I forbid you to touch her. You forbid? You? I'm in charge here. No one forbids me. Do you understand? You're insane. You're... If you lay your hands on her, I'll kill you. So help me. I'll kill you. Very well, Mr. Winton. If you do not wish me to operate, that's all there is to it. I would scarcely force my service upon you. However, the girl's condition is quite serious, and I... <coughs> ah, good work. Good work, Cato, my boy. A master stroke. Ah, do you still forbid me, Mr. Winton? Do you? Do you? Oh, you don't answer. Good, good. Take him to the cellar, Cato, and lodge him there with his friend, Dr. Morrissey. Yes. They should have a good deal to talk over in the still hours of the night while I cure the young lady's headache unmolested. <laughs> got to pull yourself together, Leslie. I'll try. Try to think. Akedo brought you down a few moments ago. You've been hit in the head. Can you remember? Yes. I was talking to Kettler, trying to make him let Claire go. Claire? Oh, good Lord, Morrissey. Where is she? He, he's got her. Kettler? She's on that operating table up there. We've got to do something. We've got to do something. Well, I'm afraid there's not much we can do. I've been here for three days and nights. What happened? Uh, it was a nightmare come to life. I'd had Kettler in my office for treatment. Yeah? He was off on a wild tangent, insisting that I had a man whom he had killed hidden down here in the cellar. That I and the rest of the medical profession had kidnapped him off the operating table with his head still swathed. He thinks I've been keeping this venom from him all along, even though I've known that just one side of him would cure his mental disorders. He hates me with every fiber of his twisted brain. It's a dangerous case, Leslie. He'll... He'll kill Claire? He may. There's a slim chance he won't. What's that? Well, all the surgical instruments are locked away. It's possible they may not be able to find it. Isn't there any way we can get out of here? Well, couldn't I have used it? Where does that corridor lead to? To the staircase that goes to the first floor. Well, not a chance. It comes out of the operating room and they keep that door locked as tight as a drum. Besides, Kettler still has the pistol he took from my nurse. I've got to think. I've got to. My head hurts so I can't make good sense. Let's see that. 
I think they gave you a nasty cut. Oh, it doesn't matter. Say, Doc. Yes? What was his name? Who? The guy Kepler thought you were keeping from him. The one he killed. Benham. Ed Benham. Why? Was he a young fellow? Yes. Uh, rather tall, slender chap. Say, Doc. Hmm? Do you have any bandages down here? What? Bandages. Why, yes, I think so. They're, they're stored down here. Enough to bandage my whole head, face, and everything? Why? I might have a chance of getting through that door up there. <laughs> Let me go now. Oh, let me go. Leslie! Leslie! You will be better soon. Much better. I will take the pain away, Mrs. Winton. Cato, have you found the surgical case? Not found yet. I look. Cato, look. Find it. We must not keep Mrs. Winton in an agony. Find it, I say. You'll have to create some order in this place. I want my instruments at hand on a moment's notice. Please! Let me go! Oh, let me go! You shall be well again, my dear. I promise you, you shall. Doctor, here, tall, white curtain behind curtain. That's it. Open it. Open it, Tato. Locked. Locked, Doctor. Smash it open. Open it. I do. You'll find scalpels on the top tray. Bring them to me. Yes, Doctor. He's here, Doctor. See, knives. Good, sharp knives. Tato find. He find them. Excellent. How they glitter. Ah, uh, it's good to feel the knife in my hand again. Put the others right beside my pistol here on the table. Please. Oh, please. There, there, my girl. I shall extend all my genius on you. You shall be well again. No! 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 Now to work. What was that? Who's there? Dr. Kepler. Who is it? I have found my way back to you. Open the door, Dr. Kepler. I've come back again. Who are you? You remember? You remember Led Benham? Kato! Kato! Yes, Doctor. The door! The door! Let him in! He's come back! Let him in, I say! Yes, Doctor. Oh, let me out of here! He's come back! He's come back, Kato! Then I knew it. I knew it all along. You're alive. You're living. Yes, yes Dr. Kepler. You. Just as they took you from the table. Yes. They took me away before the operation was complete. Finish it now. Hurry. I can't live much longer. I'm about to die. No, no. Hey, no. Get Venom out of the table. Girl, girl on table. Take her off. Take her out of here. Put her in the cellar. Let Venom take her place. At once, you hear? Yes, Dr. Peter. No. No, I won't be put in the cellar. I won't. It might be well if you went down into the cellar, you know. It's nice down there. You'll see old friends, perhaps. Old friends who need help. Hurry. Hurry, I say. Yes, Doctor. Come. I'm coming. Are you all right, Venom? We can. We can. Hey, no. Hey, go! Close door. No, stop wasting time. Leave the door alone. Help me. Help me get Venom on the table. Yes, Doctor. Cato, do. Oh, that's right. Now listen carefully. Good. Uh, good. Oh. Now, lie back. Lie back. Gently. Gently. All right. Careful now. Here we are. Cato, give me the knife. Yes, Doctor. Take off the bandages. Mm. From the top, Cato. That's correct. That's proper procedure. There. There, now let's... Mm. I thought his hair was blonde, not black. Well, perhaps I've forgotten. I've forgotten so many things that... There was a scar on his forehead. I, I clearly remember a scar on his forehead. It, maybe. Maybe I imagine that too. This was someone else with brown eyes. Venom. Venom, didn't you have blue eyes? I know they were blue. And your nose. Your nose was thinner and longer. 
Yes. Yes. And your lips. You have thick lips. That I know. Bandages off, Doctor. Dr. Catter, there's a trick here. You... You're not Venom. You're not Venom. You're that young Mr. Winter. Dr. Catter, listen to me. Cheat. Cheat. So you wanted me to finish you, did you? Yes, Mr. Winter, I will. I will. Hold him, Cato. Uh, hold him. See the knife, Mr. Winton? Watch it glisten as it comes down, 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 and into <laughs> that he's out for Alvarez when you hear him play the piano, do That's a marvelous old instrument you have, Doc. It was my mother. This old house has been in the family for generations. Mm. Who'd ever thought we'd be alive to sit in your house and listen to somebody play a concerto? We wouldn't have been. At least I wouldn't have been if you hadn't snatched that revolver off the table right out from under Kepler's nose before they threw you into the cellar. That was the lifesaver. You made the weekend perfect. <laughs> I'm afraid it wasn't very restful. Hereafter, I'm spending all weekends in a cozy little corner under the L. <laughs> ah, it was worse for Claire than anybody. She had a dreadful time. It was ghastly, all right. Horrible. But you know something? What? My headache. It's completely gone. <laughs> The Kepler Method, the tale of a memorable weekend and a long-awaited dead man who didn't return after all. This was tonight's story of Suspense. Suspense is produced by William Spear. John Dietz was our director this evening. Tonight's radio drama was written by Peter Barry and scored by Bernard Herman. Roger DeCoven was Dr. Kepler, John Gibson, Leslie Winton, and Gloria Stewart played Claire Winton. Others in the cast were Guy Rep, Martha Faulkner, Winfield Pony, and Ralph Smiley. Next week at this time, Columbia will bring you another selected story from the world's great literature of thrill. Another study in... Suspense. This is Barry Kroger, and this is the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Columbia Network takes pleasure in bringing you Suspense. Columbia's Parade of Outstanding Thrillers, produced by William Spear and scored by Bernard Herrmann. Notable melodramas from stage and screen, fiction and radio, presented each week to bring you to the edge of your chair, to keep you in suspense. Tonight's story, by the noted American author T.S. Stribling, deals with a crime of murder on an exotic and atmospheric island with ragged beggars who slept in a Hindu temple and awoke with gold in their pockets and a dead girl lying near them and with a strange and mystical entrance into the life of hereafter, which was the experience of an American psychologist. For your suspenseful listening... We invite you to join us for A Passage to Benares. In Port of Spain, in Trinidad, at half past five in the morning, 
Mr. Henry Fagioli, an American psychologist, stirred uneasily, became conscious of a splitting headache, opened his eyes in bewilderment, and then, with a shock, saw where he was. He got up, arranged his clothing. He tried with his neat psychological mind to recapture his dream, to bottle up again the little smoking wisps that still floated about within his aching head. By seven o'clock, he found his way back to the house of Mr. Lowe, his host in Port of Spain. Lowe was already about his coffee with an interested spoon poised above the morning paper. Ah, there you are. Good morning, Bajoli. I say you are quiet. Didn't hear you get up at all. Have some breakfast? Oh, thanks. I have uh, been out for breath of air. What's the news today? Well, the new governor will arrive in Trinidad on the 12th, and, uh, uh... Hello. Another native killed his wife. Tell me, Pajoli, as a psychologist, why do coolies kill their wives? Oh, for various reasons, I imagine. Let's hear some of the facts. Oh, I say this is a coincidence. Really putting on a show for you, Pajoli, on your first visit to Trinidad. How so? Well, you... You remember that wedding procession you and I watched last evening down yeah. the, down the Hindu temple? The temple? Well, of course, the cream-colored little bride with the breastplates and the link gold coins and the anklets and all the finery. Mm -hmm. and the bridegroom. What did you say his name was? Budman Lal? Yes. Well, do you know what happened? Budman Lal is in jail this morning and his cream-colored little bride is dead with her throat cut. No. Do they think he did it? No doubt of it. That's why he's in jail now. He always seemed like a sensible fellow, too. One of our best patrons. Which only proves my contention for Jolie. A bridegroom of only six or eight hours killing his wife without any reason at all. Oh, and there's usually some reason for murder. Maybe. But I say, oh boy, you're, you're missing the point completely. How? Well, suppose you actually had gone and slept in the temple there last night. Mm -hmm. Wanted to, you know. Remember? And I said, no white man ever stays all night in a coolie temple. Remember? Yes, I remember. You said it simply isn't done. Well, if... If you had, Pajoli, I'd say, uh... That would have been a pretty kettle, wouldn't it? Yes. Yes. Well, I'm afraid I'll be mixed up in this. Both Mr. Lal and his uncle, Hyrodas, are clients of mine. Old Hyrodas is upwards of five million dollars in my bank. Hyrodas? Didn't you tell me he built that temple where the murder took place? Yes. It's what the Hindus call a temple and rest house. Hyrodas gives rice and tea to any traveler who comes in for the night. It's an Indian custom to help mendicant pilgrims. A rich Indian will build a temple and rest house just, just as you Americans erect libraries. Ah. What does it say there about the murder, though? Um, Budman Lal, nephew of the famous Mr. Hyrodas, was arrested early this morning at his home for the alleged murder of his wife, whom he married yesterday. The body was found at six o'clock this morning in the temple where the wedding ceremony took place. The temple attendants gave the alarm. The victim's head was severed completely from her body and all her jewelry was gone. Five coolie beggars who were asleep in the temple when the body was discovered were arrested. They all claimed ignorance of the crime, but a search of their persons revealed that each beggar had a piece of the bride's jewelry and a coin from her necklace. Budman Lal and his wife were seen to enter the temple at about 11 last night for the Hindu rite of purification. Mr. Lal, who is a prominent curio dealer, declines to say anything further. Doesn't tell you very much, does it? No, oh, not much. What do you make of those beggars? Oh, that's simple enough. Those devils laid in wait inside the temple until the husband went out and left his wife. Then they murdered her and divided the spoils. Ah, but she had enough bangles and g to give a dozen to each man. Yes, yes, you're quite right, Pajoli. That's a fact. Why should they continue sleeping in the temple after they'd killed her if they did murder her? Well, why shouldn't they? They knew they'd be suspected and they couldn't get off the island without capture, so they thought they might as well lie down again and go back to sleep. Hmm. You may be right, Lowe, but that doesn't look like the solution to me. Well, I'm satisfied that's how it occurred. You mean the beggars killed her? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't think so. I rather fancy that the actual murderer took the girl's jewelry and went about the temple thrusting a bangle and a coin in the pockets of each of the sleeping beggars to lay a false scent. Oh, 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 oh. oh no, that, that's laying it on a bit too thick, but you... <laughs> My dear Lord, that's the only possible explanation for the coins in the beggar's pockets. I tell you, boy, you've had lots of experience in these things. 
Come along with me and we'll go up and see Mr. Hyrad Daz and see if he can't help his nephew. I'll be glad to. But we'll go to the temple first. Then we'll call on Mr. Hyrad <laughs> Here we are. Why does the police guard at the door? The temple doesn't look sinister in the daylight. No, yeah, it just looks dirty. Yeah, let's go in and question the beggars. Hey, excuse me. Um, did any of you fellows hear noises in this temple outside? Oh, much sleep, side. No noise. Policeman Sancho's wake this morning makes it still here. What's your name? To the charm side. When did you go to sleep last night? When I ate rice and tea, Sahib. Mm-hmm. Do you remember seeing Boudman Lal and his wife enter this building last night? Uh, yes, remember, Sahib. Did you see them go out? Uh, no, Sahib. No one remember go out. You were all asleep then, huh? Uh, all asleep, Sahib. Did you have any dreams during your sleep? Hear any noises? Uh, I dream bad dreams, Sahib. Huh? When policeman punched me awake this morning, I think dream has come true. And me, Sahib. Me, did you all have bad dreams? Yes, all oh, have bad dreams. Look here, Pazzoli. I, I I don't see where this is getting us. I do think we ought to be getting on to old Haradaz's house. No, I think we can now entirely discard the theory that the beggars murdered the girls. Oh, what's wrong? They told you nothing except that they all had bad dreams. That's the reason. They all had wild, fantastic dreams. That suggests that they were given some sort of opiate in their rice or tea last night. It's quite improbable that five ignorant coolies would have wit enough to concoct such a piece of evidence as that. Mm, that's a fact, but I don't believe a Trinidad court would admit such evidence. We're not looking for legal evidence. We're after some indication of the real criminal. Now I suggest that we get onto the house of Hira Das. Come in, gentlemen. I've been expecting you. Please be seated. Thank you. Thank you. A most mysterious murder in the life of my poor nephew will depend upon your exertions, gentlemen. Tell me, what do you think of the beggars that were found in the temple with the bangles and coins? Well, I'm afraid my judgment of the beggars will disappoint you, Mr. Hyradas. Huh? My theory is that they are innocent of the crime. Really? Why do you say that? Because they told me of dreams they had. And all their dreams were very nearly identical. You are not English, sir. No Englishman would have thought of that. No, I'm American with a backlash sprinkling of, uh, of Italian. My name's Pagioli. What is your profession, Mr. Pagioli? You are a detective? No, Mr. Das. I'm a psychologist. Oh. Your soul is at least groping after knowledge. However, it gropes as a blind worm, Mr. Pajoli, and we must find the criminal who committed this crime and thus restore my nephew, Boodman Lal, to liberty. You can imagine what a blow this has been to me after I arranged this marriage for my nephew. You did? Arranged a marriage for a nephew who was in his thirties? Yes, Mr. Pajoli. Mm. I wanted him to avoid the pitfalls into which I fell. Ah. He was unmarried, and he'd already begun to add dollars to dollars. I did the same thing. Now, look at me. An empty old man in a foreign land. What good is this house where men of my own kind can't come and sit with me when I have no grandchildren to romp and play? No. I've piled up dollars and pounds. I, I've eaten the world, Mr. Pajoli, and found it bitter. Now here I am, an outcast. And why don't you go back to India, Mr. Hyrida? Why, Mr. Pajoli, my mind is half English. If I should return to Benares, I'd walk about thinking what the temples cost, how much was the value of the stone set in the eye of Krishna's image. If I would ever be one with my own people again, Mr. Pajoli, 
I must leave this Western mind and body here in Trinidad. That's um, very interesting and moving, but uh, we were discussing your nephew, Budman Lau. Wait. In searching for the criminal, I would suggest you look for a moneyed man. Let me tell you my suspicions, and you can work out the details. What are they? I went out to the temple this morning to have the body of my poor murdered knee brought here to my villa for burial. I talked to the five beggars and they told me there was a big sleeper in the temple last night. Was there indeed? Yes, Mr. Lowe. A white man. A white man? Yes, Mr. Lowe. All five of the coolies and my man, Guka, told me it was true. But, Mr. Hyradas, decapitation is not an American mode of murder. American? I, I... I was speaking generally. I mean a white man's method of murder. That is indicative in itself. I meant to call your attention to that point. It shows the white man was a highly educated man who had studied the mental habits of other people than his own. So he was enabled to give the crime an extraordinary resemblance to a Hindu crime. But what motive could a white man have? Possibly robbery, Mr. Pajoli. Or if he were a very intellectual man, he might have murdered the poor child by a way of experiment. A murderful experiment? Yes, Mr. Lowe. To record the psychological reaction. Why? Oh, I, I can't entertain such a... There is that, Mr. Harrider. Oh, no. It is too far there. However, it is worth investigating, is it not? Yes, yes, but I'll begin my investigations with the man Guka. By all means, Mr. Kajori. And in your investigations, gentlemen, hire any assistance you may need. Draw on me for any amount. I want my nephew exonerated, and above all things, I want the real criminal apprehended and brought to the gallows. Oh, what do you think of that, Pajoli? White man in that temple. Ah, sounds like pure fiction to me, to, to shield Bob and Lau. You know, these fellows hang together like thieves. Say, it's a jolly good thing we didn't decide to sleep in the temple last night, isn't it? You know, in my opinion, Lowe, the actual criminal is Boodman Lowe. Ah, same here. I thought so ever since I first saw the account in the paper. Somehow these fellows will chop their wives to pieces for no reason at all. Well, what do you know about Boodman Lowe? Well, he, he was born here, and his aura has been a figure because of his rich uncle. He lived here all his life? Uh-huh. Except when he was in Oxford for six years. Oh, he's an Oxford man, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, there you are. That's the trouble. I don't understand. What do you mean, Pozzoli? I know that he fell in love with some English girl, but when old Hira Das chose a Hindu child for his wife, Woodman couldn't refuse marriage. No man's going to quarrel with a $5 million legacy. Then he chose this ghastly method of getting rid of the child bride. Uh, I dare say you're right. I feel sure Bergman Lau killed the girl. And Jones, I'm getting tired of walking. There's a cab. Let's hop it and ride the rest of the way. Hi, cabby! A cab! I say, oh, I... Well, aren't you coming? You know, I don't feel that I can conscientiously continue this investigation trying to clear a person whom I have every reason to believe guilty. But, man, don't leave me like this. At least come as far as police headquarters with me and explain your theory about Guga, the temple keeper, and the right. Well, I... Uh... I thought I'd go back to your cottage and pack my things. Pack your things? Oh, your boat doesn't sail until Friday. Yes, I know, but there's a daily service to cure us all. It took me to go there. Oh, again. no. Come, you can't run off like that just when I stirred up an interesting murder mystery for you to unravel. Why, well, Jolie, you ought to appreciate my efforts as a host more than that. Well, all right, then. To the police station. Yes, I... Hey, come on. Chief Vickers, uh, this is my friend, Mr. Pajoli. 
Pozzoli, Mr. Vickers is chief of Trinidad's police force. How do you do? How do you do? Uh, chief Vickers, I've, um, I've asked Mr. Pozzoli's counsel in the Budman Lau murder case. He's already developed a theory as to who is the actual murderer of Mrs. Budman Lau. So have I. Now, in this matter, Chief Vickers, uh, I want to be perfectly frank with you. I'll admit we're in this case in the employ of Mr. Haradaz and are making an effort to clear his nephew, Budman Lau. We felt confident you'd use the skill of the police department of Port of Spain to work out a theory clearing Budman Lau just as readily as you would to convict him. A uh, department usually devotes its time to conviction and not to clearing criminals. Yes, yes, I, I know that, but if our theory will point out the actual murderer... What is your theory? Mr. Poggioli's deduction is based on the dreams of the men who were found in the temple. So Mr. Poggioli's deduction is based on dreams. It would be a remarkable coincidence, Mr. Beckers, if five men had lurid dreams simultaneously without some physical cause. It suggests strongly that their tea or rice was doped. Now, if you find out what soporific was used, then have your men search the sales record of the drugstores in the city to see who has lately bought such a drug. You will find the murderer. Uh-huh. How do you like Trinidad, Mr. Poggioli? I like it very much indeed. You've just arrived, haven't you? Yes. In uh, what university do you teach back in the States? Ohio State. A chair of criminal psychology in an ordinary state university? I'm not a professor. I'm simply a docent, and I haven't specialized on criminal psychology. I, I quiz on general psychology. You're not teaching now? No, this is my sabbatical year. You look young to have taught in the university six years. Look then, you Americans start young, and you're landed specialist. Now, are you, uh, Mr. Poggioli, I suppose you're wrapped up heart and soul in your psychology. I am. You'd uh, do anything in the world to advance yourself in the science. I rather think so. Especially keen on original research work. Ah, <laughs> that's what he is, Chief Vickers. You know what he asked me to do yesterday afternoon? <laughs> no, what, Mr. Lowe? Oh, I don't think we ought to burden Mr. Vickers with our household anecdotes. Oh, but I'm really curious. Just what did Mr. Poggioli ask you to do yesterday afternoon, Mr. Lowe? Oh, well, really nothing, nothing at all. It was just a little psychological experiment he wanted to do. And did he do it? Oh, no, 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 no. I wouldn't hear of it. Oh, as uh, unconventional as that? Oh, it was really nothing, nothing at all. I think I could guess your anecdote if I tried, gentlemen. About a half an hour ago, I received a telephone message from my man stationed at the temple to keep a lookout for you and Mr. Poggioli. A lookout for us? Yes, because one of the coolies under arrest told him that Mr. Poggioli slept in the temple last night. Oh, but that's not true. That's exactly what he didn't do. He suggested it to me, but I said no. You remember, Poggioli, you... You didn't do it. Did you, Poggioli? Did you? You see, he did. Gentlemen... I had a perfectly valid and important reason for sleeping in the temple last night, and so I I can only ask your sympathetic attention to what I'm about to say. Go on. You remember, Lowe, you and I were down there watching a wedding procession. Well, just as the music stopped and the procession entered the building, suddenly it seemed to me as if... as if they'd vanished. Naturally, they'd gone into the building. Oh, no, I don't mean that. I'm afraid you won't understand what I do mean. That the whole procession had ceased to exist, melted into nothing. You see, that's really the idea in which the Hindus base their notion of heaven... Oblivion, nothing. Yes, I've heard that before. Well, our medieval Gothic architecture was a conception of our Western heaven, and I thought perhaps the Indian architecture had somehow caught the motif of the Indian religion, you know, suggested ni- nirvana. That's what amazed and intrigued me. That's why I wanted to sleep in the place. I wanted to see if I could further my shred of impression. Does that make any sense to you, Mr. Baker? We're not interested why you went, Mr. Pajole. We know a murder took place in the temple. <laughs> You can't think that I committed a horrible murder as an experiment. You intellectual chaps do some pretty weird things, Mr. Poggioli. Why, only the other day I was reading about two young intellectuals. Yes, these fellows I read about also tried to turn an honest penny by their murder. I don't suppose you happened to notice yesterday that the little bride, Maila Ran, was almost covered with gold bangles and coins? Of course I noticed I had nothing whatever to do with her. I, I, I did sleep in the temple. Well, by the way, you say you slept on a rug just as the coolies did. Yes, I did. And you didn't wake up either, Mr. Pajo? No, no. Then did the child's murderer happen to put a coin and a bangle in your pocket, just as he did the other sleepers in the temple? I don't know. I, I haven't looked in my pocket since then. Then please do so now, Mr. Pajo. Oh, yes. Here they are, Mr. You don't happen to have any more, do you? No. 
I've already been through all my pockets and I haven't any more. Well, that's something. Of course, you might have expected just such a questioning as this and provided yourself with these two pieces of gold, but I doubt it. Somehow, I don't believe that you're an experienced enough man to think of such a thing. However, we shall see. I suppose you have no objection, Mr. Pajoli, to my accompanying you over to have a little search of your baggage in Mr. Lowe's cottage. Now then, Mr. Pajoli, be so kind as to open your trunk. Good heavens. Mm Mm-hmm. Just as I thought. A trunk tray full of bangles and coins. I'll say one thing for you, though, Mr. Pajoli. Your nerve almost got you by. But you... You can't believe that I did it. So. You don't believe I did this, do you? I... I I don't. You trunk, If I did it, I would sleepwalking. God, to think that it's possible, but right here in my own... Well, time. we might as well start back, I suppose. This is all. I'll, I'll go back with you, Paul Jolie. I'll see you through. Somehow I can't. I, I won't believe you did it. You know, Paul Jolie, you set out to clear Budman Lal and, well, dash it all. It looks as if you had. No, he didn't. Budman Lal was out of jail at least an hour before you fellows came into police headquarters to see me. Oh, you mean that you turned him loose? Yes. How's that, Chief Vickers? Because, Mr. Lowe, he didn't go to the temple at all with his wife last night. He went down to Queen's Park Hotel and played billiards till one o'clock. He called up a few friends and proved that easily enough. Well, that, that leaves nobody but... Yes, Pagioli. I don't know anything about it. If I did commit the murder, I was asleep. I don't know anything about it. That's all I can say. I don't know anything about it. Perhaps the rest in jail will help restore your memory. Well, we'll see. Come now, Pajoli, old man. Don't be too downhearted. I promise you, I'll do everything I can. The case against Henry Pajoli having been duly tried by a jury of your peers who have been found guilty by the powers invested in me, I herewith sentence you to be hanged by the neck until you are dead. To recall a lost dream is the most tantalizing task ever a human brain was gripped to. But if I lie still long enough on this buck, perhaps I can recapture the dream I had in the temple last night. Yes. Yes. It seems to me that the image on the altar moved, and suddenly the dome overhead was opened and left me staring upward into a vast abyss where I was alone in endless space, where all creatures and all matter that had ever been or ever would be were wrapped up in me. Pajoli. That was my dream. That's an odd thing. Six men dreaming the same dream in different terms. There must be a physical cause for such a phenomenon. Of course. I've got it. Vickers. Oh. I have it. I've solved it. Get me out of here. I know who killed the girl. What is it, my friend? I know who murdered the bride. Hold her adapted. Now listen. Listen. Go tell Decker to take the gold he found in my trunk and develop all the fingerprints on it. He'll find Hira Das's prints. Also tell him to follow out that opiate clue I gave him. He'll find Hira Das and a man to put the gold in my trunk. See if they don't find brass or steel filings in my room where the scoundrel sat and filed a new key. But they've already done that long ago. They have. But mm-hmm. certainly. And old Hira Das confessed everything. Though why a rich old man like him should have murdered a pretty child is more than I can see. Oh, 
Why did he pick on me as a scapegoat? Oh, he explained that to the police. He said he picked out a white man so the police would make a thorough investigation and be sure to catch him. Didn't I? But what I can't see is why the old boy wanted to be caught and hanged. Well, why didn't he commit suicide? Why? I know why. Because according to his religion, in that case his soul would have returned in the form of some beast. He wanted to be slain because he expects to be reborn instantly in Benares. His little Maya Loran is his bride instead of his nephews. He hopes to be a great man with wife and children. All the things he was not here in Trinidad. Yes, yes, you must be right. Why didn't you come and tell me of old Haradak's confession the moment it occurred? What do you mean keeping me here when you know I'm an innocent man? Why didn't you tell me before this? Because I couldn't. Old Hyradaus didn't confess until a month and ten days after you were hanged. So ends the passage to Benares, T.S. Stribling's tale of mysterious death and death mysterious. This was tonight's story of... Suspense. Suspense is produced by William Spear. John Deitch was our guest director this evening. Tonight's radio drama was written by Carol Case and scored by Bernard Herman. Paul Stewart was Pajoli, Barry Krogel was Mr. Hyra Dan, and Horace Bram played Mr. Lowe. Others in the cast were Alan Hewitt and Guy Rex. Next week at this time, Columbia will bring you another selected story from the world's great literature of thrills. Another study in suspense. This is Barry Kroger, and this is the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Columbia Network takes pleasure in bringing you Suspense. Suspense, Columbia's play theater of outstanding thrillers, produced and directed by William Spear and scored by Bernard Herrmann. The notable melodramas from fiction and stage and screen, from the world's great literature of entertaining excitement, presented each week to bring you to the edge of your chair, to keep you in... Suspense. Tonight's story, by America's distinguished author-playwright Owen Johnson, gathers its suspense in a very gentle way. It doesn't have a spectacular finish, garnished with revolver shots. There are no graveyard watches. There's not so much as a single lifeless body, identified or unidentified. It's a tale told in a club room, the Artists and Writers Club in New York. A tale of high-class robbery and suspicion and of how some ladies and gentlemen nervously counted one hundred in the dark. Ah, that was a fine meal. Me for the club any time. Yeah, here, we can all sit here, please. Yes, if you just draw up that chair for Mr. Peters. Oh, yeah, there you go. Thank you. Uh, do you all know Peters? Uh, this is Mr. Steingall. Uh, how do you do? I am. Uh, Mr. Goldier? Yeah? Oh, I agree with Matt. Oh, yes. yes. How are you? Oh, you oh. know each other. Yes, yes. yes. And the one who drew up the chair, Mr. Rankin. Now, how do you do? Thank well, you I, guess, I, I guess we're all acquainted now. Um, to get back to our table discussion, Quinny. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, how about a drink? Who'll join me? Oh, oh yeah, pleasure. pleasure. Fine, yeah. fine. Uh, John. Well, now, Steingall, as I said, there are only half a dozen stories in the world. What is more to the point? There's every reason Yes, to... sir. What? Huh? Oh. Uh, five uh, with soda, John. Yes, sir. Now, now, where was I? Oh, oh, yes. What is more to the point, gentlemen, is the small number of human relations that are so simple and yet so fundamental that they can be eternally played upon, redressed and reinterpreted in every language in every age and yet remain inexhaustible. In the possibility of variation. Well, that's true, of course. It's very possible. Take the no. eternal triangle. Two men and a woman. 
or to women and a man. Its variations extend to thousands. That right, Rankin? Well, in a way. Ah, oh, here we are. Uh, set them down right there, John. Very well, sir. Uh, a little soda. Uh, here you are. Uh, thank you. And you? Uh, uh, soda, Peter? Yes, please. Yeah. Another one. Here you are. Thanks. And here's yours. Thank you. And now, a little soda in mine. Uh, well, here's to you all. Cheers, cheers. I'm afraid we can't see eye to eye, Quinny. I believe there are situations, original situations, that are independent of your human emotions. That exist just because they are situations. Accidental and nothing else. As for instance? Well, I'll just cite an ordinary one that happens to come to my mind. In a group of five men, well, such as we are here, a theft takes place. One man is the thief. Well, which one? Now, I'd like to know what emotion that interprets. And yet it certainly is an original theme at the bottom of the whole literature. It's not the same thing at all. Ah, detective stories. I could answer that the situation you give can be traced back to the commonest of human emotions. Curiosity. I think uh, Quinny has you there, Rankin. Hmm. What is the peculiar fascination that the detective problem exercises over the human mind? You will say, curiosity. Hmm. Yes and no. Admit at once that the whole art of a detective story consists in the statement of the problem. Anyone can do it. I can do it. Steingall can do it. Uh, Rankin, I believe even you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> the solution doesn't count. It is usually banal. It should be prohibited. What interests us is, can we guess it? There you have it. The problem, the detective story. Now, why the fascination? I'll tell you. It appeals to our curiosity. Yes. But deeper, to a sort of intellectual vanity. Five men present. The theft takes place. Who's the thief? Who will guess it first? Whose brains will show its superior cleverness? You see? That's all. That's all there is to it. Out of all of which, the interesting thing is that Rankin has supplied the reason why the supply of detective fiction is inexhaustible. It does all come down to the simplest terms. Five possibilities, one answer. Well, the reason is that the situation does constantly occur. It's a situation that any of us might get into any time. Yes, I know of an incident of that kind that happened to a friend of mine last month. Of course, of course, gentlemen, you are glorifying commonplaces. Every crime, I tell you, expresses itself in the terms of the picture puzzle that you feed your six-year-olds. It's only the variation that is interesting. I'll take the well-known instance of the visitor at a club and the rare coin, for example. You all know that story. You've heard uh, that I don't think I have. I'm not sure. Why, it's, it's very well-known. Oh, go ahead, Quinny. Tell it. A distinguished visitor is brought into a club. A dozen men, say, present at dinner, long table. Conversation finally veers around to curiosities and relics. One of the members present then takes from his pocket what he announces as one of the rarest coins in existence. Passes it around the table. Coin travels back and forth. Everyone examining it. And the conversation goes to another topic. All at once, the owner calls for his coin. It is nowhere to be found. Everyone looks at everyone else. First, they suspect a joke. Then it becomes serious. The coin is immensely valuable. Who has taken it? The owner is a gentleman. Does the gentlemanly, idiotic thing, of course, laughs as he knows someone is playing a practical joke on him and that the coin will be returned tomorrow. The others refuse to leave the situation so. One man proposes that they all submit to a search. Everyone gives his assent until it comes to the stranger. He refuses, curtly, roughly, without giving any reason. Uncomfortable silence. The man is a guest. No one knows him particularly well, but still he is a guest. One member tries to make him understand that no offense is offered. That the suggestion was simply to clear the atmosphere. The stranger becomes very firm, very proud, and says, I refuse to allow my person to be searched, and I refuse to give the reason for my action. Another silence. The visitor evidently has the coin, but he is their guest, and etiquette protects him. <laughs> nice situation, eh? Huh? Well, what's the answer? The table is cleared. A waiter removes a dish of fruit, and there, under the ledge of the plate, where it's been pushed, is the coin. Banal explanation, eh? Of course. Solutions always should be. At once, everyone apologizes to him. 
Whereupon the visitor rises and says, Now I can give you the reason for my refusal to be searched. There are only two known specimens of that coin in existence. And the second happens to be here in my vest pocket. That's rather obvious. <laughs> of course, the story is well invented. But the turn to it is very nice. Very nice, indeed. Well, I don't know. Ending is very unsatisfactory. The visitor should have had on him not another coin, but uh, something absolutely different. Something uh, destructive, say, of a, a woman's reputation and a... Great tragedy should have been threatened by the casual misplacing of the coin. Well, I've heard the same story told in a dozen different ways. Oh, it's happened a hundred times. It must continually happen. I know of one extraordinary instance, in fact, the most extraordinary instance of this sort I've ever heard. Peters, you rascal. I see you've been quietly letting us set the stage for you. Well, it's <laughs> not a story that will please everyone. Why not? Because you will want to know what no one can ever know. It has no conclusion, then? Yes and no. As far as it concerns a woman, quite the most remarkable woman I've ever met, the story is complete. Uh, do I know the woman? Possibly. Probably, I should say. Uh -huh. As a matter of fact, this should be particularly interesting to you because <clears throat> I believe that most of you are acquainted with the people involved. Uh, the names, of course, are disguised. I think... Uh, yes, I have. Just time before I catch my train to tell it to you. <laughs> Well, Mrs. Rita Kildare inhabited a charming bachelor girl studio. Very elegant. With a duplex pattern and one of the buildings just off Central Park West. She knew very nearly everyone in that indescribable society in New York that's drawn from all levels. And that imposes but one condition for membership. To be amusing. In this mingled society, her invitations were eagerly sought. Her dinners were spontaneous... And the discussions, though gay and usually daring, were invariably under the control of wit and good taste. On the Sunday night of this adventure, she had, according to her custom, sent away her Filipino butler and invited to an informal chafing dish supper seven of her more unusual friends. At seven o'clock, having finished dressing, she put in order her bedroom, which formed a sort of free passage between the studio and a small dining room to the kitchen beyond. Then, going into the studio, she struck a match and was about to light the candlesticks which illuminated the room when the bell rang. And a Mr. Flanders, a broker, compact, nervously alive, well-groomed, was waiting as she opened the door. Well, you're early. On the contrary, you are late. <laughs> well, in any case, hello, and come inside. Here, let me take your things. Thank you. Well, I'm the first, I suppose. Of course. And since you are, you can be a good boy and help me with the candles. Delighted. <sighs> Who's to be here tonight? The Enos Jacksons. I thought they were separated. Not yet. How interesting. Only you, dear lady, would dream of serving us a couple on the verge. It is interesting, isn't it? Assuredly. Uh, where did you know Jackson? Through the Warings. Uh, Jackson's a rather doubtful person, isn't he? Well, let's call him a very sharp lawyer. They tell me, though, he's been gambling pretty much. Indeed. How about yourself? Oh, me? I'm a bachelor. If I lose my shirt, it makes no difference. Is that possible? Probably even. Who else is coming? Oh, uh, Maud Lilly. You know her? No, I don't think so. You met her here some time ago, a journalist. Oh, yes, yes, of course. I'd forgotten. Mr. Harris, the clubman, is coming, and the Stanley Cheevers. Stanley Cheevers? Are we going to gamble? Don't tell me you object. <laughs> Certainly not. Only the Cheevers. <laughs> they play quite a game. Yes, well united. <laughs> they have an unusual streak of good luck. <laughs> oh, by the way, it's uh, Jackson, isn't it, who is so attractive to Mrs. Cheever? Quite right. What a charming party. Hey, where does Maud Lily come in? Don't joke. She's in a desperate way. And young Harris? Oh, he's to make the salad and cream the chicken. Ah. <sighs> See the whole party. I, of course, am to add the element of respectability. Of what? Don't play baby with me, my dear Flanders. I apologize. That's better. No one, of course, knows who else is coming. No one, of course. The Stanley Cheevers enter. Short, fat man with a vacant, fat face and slow-moving eye... And his wife, voluble, nervous, overdressed, and pretty. Mr. 
Yes, Mr. Harris. He came in with Maud Lilly. A woman, straight, dark, Indian, great masses of somber hair, held in a little too loosely for neatness, with thick, quick lips and eyes that rolled away from the person who was talking to her. The Enos Jacksons were late, and still agitated as they entered. His forehead had not quite banished the scowl, nor her eyes the scorn. He was of the type that never lost his temper, but caused others to lose theirs. And Mrs. Jackson seemed fastened to her husband by an invisible leash. You looked at her curiously and wondered what such a nature would do in a crisis with a lurking sense of a woman who carried with her her own impending tragedy. As soon as the company had been completed and the incongruity of the selection had been perceived... A smile of malicious anticipation ran the rounds, which the hostess cut short by saying, Well, well, now that everyone's here, this is the order for the night. You can quarrel all you want, you can whisper all the gossip you can think of about one another, but everyone is to be amusing. Also, everyone is to help with dinner. And nothing formal, nothing serious. We may all be bankrupt, divorced, or dead tomorrow. But tonight we'll be gay. That's the invariable rule of the house. Oh, dear. Oh, Mrs. Chase, Hi, you? Will you? May I be of any help? Thank you, Maud, dear. Oh, Mrs. Chase, oh, you might come along, too. All right. This is an adorable bedroom. Oh, thank you, dear. Uh, now for my apron. Oh, there it is. Uh, tie me up in the back, will you please, Maud? Of course. There you are. Fine, thanks. Now just let me get my rings off and I'll be all ready to go to work. Oh, this is such a lovely apartment. Still there? Thanks. Soap and water always seem to do it. Ah, there. Your rings are so beautiful. They are nice, aren't they? But there's only one that's very valuable. The sapphire. Oh, it's beautiful. Let me see. Oh, well, it must be very valuable. It cost 10000 six years ago. It's been my talisman ever since. For the moment, however... I'm a cook. You're not going to leave the rings there. Why, of course. Now, I'm the cook. Uh, Maud Lilly, you're the story maid. Harris is the chef, and we're all under his orders. Mrs. Cheever, mm. did you ever peel onions? Oh, good heavens, no. <laughs> well, there are no onions to peel. All you have to do is help set the table. <laughs> Under their hostess's gay guidance, the seven guests began to circulate busily through the rooms, laying the table, grouping the chairs, opening bottles, and preparing the material for the chafing dishes. Mrs. Kildare, in the kitchen, ransacked the icebox, and with her own hand, shredded the chicken and measured the cream. Flanders, carry this in carefully. Cheever, stop watching your wife and put the salad bowl on the table. <laughs> Everything ready, Harris? All set. All right, uh, everyone sit down. I'll be right in. She went into her bedroom, took off her apron and hung it in the closet. Then going to her dressing table, she drew the hat pin around which were her rings from the pin cushion and carelessly slipped them on her fingers. But all at once, she frowned and looked quickly at her hand. Only two rings were there. The third ring, the sapphire, was missing. Stupid. She said to herself and returned to her dressing table. Immediately she stopped. She remembered quite clearly putting the hat pin through the three rings. She made no attempt to search further, but remained without moving, her fingers slowly drumming on the table. Who had taken the ring? Each of her guests had had a dozen opportunities in the course of the time she'd been busy in the kitchen. She ran over their characters and their situations as she knew them. Strangely enough, at each, her mind stopped upon some reason that might explain a sudden temptation. To find out nothing this way. That's not the important thing to me just now. The important thing is to get the ring back. And slowly, deliberately, she began to walk back and forth, a clenched hand beating the deliberate, rhythmic measure of her journey. 
five minutes later, as Harris, installed as chef over the chafing dish, was giving directions, spoon in the air, Mrs. Kildare came into the room like a lengthening shadow. Her entrance had been made with scarcely a perceptible sound, and yet each guest was aware of it at the same moment, with a little nervous start. Evans! Evans, dear lady, you come in on us like a Greek tragedy. What is it you have for us? A surprise? I have something to say to you. Mr. Enos Jackson. Yes, Miss Kilder? Kindly do as I ask you. Certainly. Go to the door. Go to the door? Please. Yes? Lock it. And bring me the key. Here you are. You've locked it? As you wish me to. Thank you. Now, the bedroom door. Would you do the same? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. Mr. Cheever. Eh? Uh? Would you blow out all the candles except the candelabra on the table? Blow out all the candles? Except the candelabra. All right. Well, uh, for goodness sake, Mrs. Kildare. What is it? I am getting terribly worked up. My, my nerves are all over. Mrs. Jackson. That's the last candle. All right. Now listen. My sapphire ring has just been stolen. What? You don't mean it. The ring's been taken within the last 20 minutes. I'm not going to mince words. The ring has been taken, and the thief is among you. But Mrs. Kildare, is it possible? Yes, Mrs. Cheever. There's not the slightest doubt. Three of you were in the bedroom when I placed my rings on the pincushion. Quite true. I was in the room when she took them off. The sapphire ring was on top. Each of you has passed through there a dozen times since. My sapphire ring is gone. And one of you has taken it. Now, now listen. I'm not going to miss words. I'm not going to stand on ceremony. But I'm going to have my ring back. Listen to me carefully. I'm going to have that ring back. And until I do, not a soul shall leave this room. I don't care who's taken it. All I want is my ring. Now, I'm going to make it possible for whoever took it to restore it without possibility of detection. The doors are locked and will stay locked. I'm going to blow out the remaining candles in the candelabra. And I'm going to count 100 slowly. It will be in absolute darkness. No one will know or see what's done. But if, at the end of that time, the ring is not here on the table, I shall telephone the police and have everyone in this room searched. Am I quite clear? Everyone take his place about the table and uh, remain standing, please. That's it. That'll do. Now, I'll blow out the candles and count 100. No more, no less. Remember... Either I get that ring, or everyone in this room will be searched. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, <coughs> twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty. Thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, forty, forty-one, forty-two, forty-three, forty-four, forty-five. Foot slipped off the chair. I'm sorry. Forty-seven, forty-eight, forty-nine, fifty. Fifty-one, fifty-two, fifty-three, fifty-four, fifty-five, fifty-six, fifty-seven, fifty-eight, fifty-nine, forty, forty-one, forty-two, forty-three, forty-four, forty-five, forty-six, forty-seven, forty-eight, forty-nine, forty-two
57, 58, 59, 60, 61, 62, 63, 64, 65, 66, 67, 68, 69, 70, 71, 72, 73. The ring. 74. Oh, there it is. 75. 76. 77. 78. 79. 80. 81. 82. 83. 84. 85. 86. 87. 88. Oh, really? 89. 90. 91. 92. 93. 94, 95, 96, 97, 98, 99, 100. Well, 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 Mr. Cheever, you may hand it to me. Well, now that that's over, we can have a very gay little supper. The light, someone. And there you are, gentlemen. Oh, I say, Peters, that's not all. Absolutely. The story ends there? Story ends there. But uh, who took the ring? <laughs> what? You it never found out? Never. No clue? None. I'm not sure I like the story. Uh, it's no story at all. Permit me, it is a story. And it is complete. In fact, I consider it unique because it has none of the banalities of a solution and leaves the problem even more confused than at the start. Well, I don't of see... Of course you don't see, my dear Enkin. You do not see that any solution would be commonplace, whereas no solution leaves an extraordinary intellectual problem. Oh, how so? Well, in the first place, whether the situation actually happened or not, which is in itself a mere triviality, Peters has constructed it in a masterly way, the proof of which is that he has made me listen. Any of those present might have taken the ring. There are therefore seven solutions, all possible and all logical. But beyond this is left a great intellectual problem. How uh, so? Was it a woman who lacked the necessary courage to continue? Or was it a man who repented his first impulse? Is a man or is a woman the greater natural criminal? Oh, that's simple, Quinny. A woman took it, of course. Well, on the contrary, it was a man for... The second action was more difficult than the first. The man, certainly. The restoration of the ring was a logical decision. You see? Personally, I incline to a woman for the reason that a weaker feminine nature is strangely susceptible to the domination of her own sex. There you are. We could meet and debate the subject year in and year out and never agree. Uh, I, I recognize most of the characters, Peters. Uh, Mrs. Kildare, of course, is all you say of her. An extraordinary woman. The story is quite characteristic of her. Flanders, I'm not sure of, but I think I know him. I'm positive I do. Did it really happen? Exactly as I told it. The only one I don't recognize is Harris, your humble servant. What? You, Peters? You were there? I was there. I was Harris. I beg your pardon, gentlemen. Oh, yes, what is it, John? Uh, Mr. Peters, sir, your train. You told me to remind you. Oh, thank you. Yes, I didn't notice so late. Will you gentlemen pardon me? Huh? Of course. Yes, sir. Nice to meet you all. Good night. Curious chap. Extraordinary. Well, now, I... I wonder. I wonder if we're wondering the same thing, gentlemen. And so, with the enigmatic smile of Mr. Peters, or Harris, ends One Hundred in the Dark, Owen Johnson's smooth story which gave us tonight's... Suspense. Suspense is produced by William Spear. Tonight's radio drama was written by Jack Anson Fink, directed by John Dietz, and scored by Bernard Herman. Eric Dressler was Mr. Peters... Alice Frost played Mrs. Kildare, and Ted Osborne, Quinny. Others in the cast were Helen Lewis, Joan Shea, Henriette Kay, Frank Reddick, Paul Luther, Stephen Schnabel, Ian Martin, and Barry Kroger. 
With this evening's performance, Columbia brings to a conclusion the present series of Suspense. If you like these broadcasts, CBS would be pleased to hear from you. Suspense has been a series presented for your relaxation and enjoyment by the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>